Good evening, all friends. Uh, Dr. Rajamendran here, your surgery faculty. Thank you all for attending the session. This is going to be a session for two and a half hours. I think probably two and a half to three and a half, three hours. So, uh, so best wishes from Dr. Rajamendran, author of uh, Surgery Sixer and other books. So, best wishes from my hospital, RRM Gastro, Philippuram, Tamil Nadu. So, I am from Tamil Nadu, India. So I thank Dr. Banu Prakash and uh, Dr. Dales for giving me an opportunity to do a session for uh, you all guys. Uh, so this is going to be a session in English only, so don't worry. Uh, so we are going to start the various systems one by one. The first topic is on general surgery and trauma. So let us start with the various, I'm going to revise the entire surgery in two and a half hours, uh, giving some images, asking some questions, etc. No need to write the notes. I will share you this PDF at the end of the session. Uh, in various uh, telegram channels, so don't worry. So what is this catheter? This is a central venous pressure catheter. So please understand guys, this is a central venous pressure catheter, which is inserted into the central veins. So there are basic questions from FMG exam, central veins where we insert this catheter are IJV, subclavian vein and femoral vein. These are the three commonly used places of inserting the central vein catheter. You can see it is having three lumen. One, two, three. Can you tell me what are the three uses of the each lumen? Each lumen has one use. One lumen is for measuring CVP, okay, measuring central venous pressure, which is normally less than five millimeters mercury. It is a venous pressure with one catheter, you can connect to a, a fluid column and we can measure central venous pressure. Okay, number one. Number two, so number two is for giving antibiotics, IV fluids, or even total parenteral nutrition can be given through another one lumen. So number two is for giving antibiotics, IV fluids, or any uh, anything you want to give, you use one lumen. The third lumen is for taking blood sample, taking blood sample, okay? So each one, you can use it for one purpose. That is why we have a three lumen catheter. If you are not interested in measuring central venous pressure, we can also use a two lumen catheter, okay? There are two lumen catheter available, single lumen catheter available. The basic FMG questions, so I'll be considering all the important FMG questions, which is the best vein for total parenteral nutrition, for giving total parenteral nutrition, which is the best vein. So can you tell me, thank you all friends. Let us concentrate on the session. We will discuss any doubts. If you have, we will discuss later, okay? So best vein for uh, TPNS, please don't forget the best vein is very good, a very good uh, discrete fusion. The subclavian vein, best vein in case of Trauma, best vein which will I use in trauma? It is IJV. Okay, for trauma, I will use IJV. For TPN, I will use subclavian vein. Which among these two lines, for example, interjugular vein is inserted between the two heads of sternocleidomastite. Subclavian vein inserted below the clavicle, mid clavicular point. So between the two heads of sternocleidomastite, below the clavicle. So there are two routes of inserting the central vein catheter. The most common question. Which among these two veins is two line is dangerous, which can cause tension pneumothorax? By injuring the lungs, we can cause tension pneumothorax is most common with which line? Can you tell me which line has more chances of tension pneumothorax? Tension pneumothorax is common with subclavian vein because we are entering below the clavicle, so we have chances of entering into the lungs and the pleura. So tension pneumothorax is most common with subclavian vein. Infection is most common with infection is most common with internal jugular vein. So please don't forget these basic questions. Infection of the cannula is one of the common complications. Infection is common with internal jugular vein. So you can see the two images. This question can come for your exam. So what is the vein inserted here? It is a subclavian vein which can cause tension pneumothorax more commonly. So tension pneumothorax more commonly, and this is a vein through which internal jugular vein it is inserted. So after inserting this central vein, yes, uh, to be frank, some of you have mentioned infection, zygotic nigma, that is correct. If they are giving choice of femoral vein, femoral vein has more chances of infection than IJV. So among the two, IJV is more common for than subclavian vein. So overall most common, if they ask you an exam, overall most common infection is with femoral vein, no doubt, okay. So overall most common is femoral vein. Among the two internal jugular vein and subclavian vein, IJV is more common than subclavian vein. Okay, so please don't forget this basic point. And most important question, where should be the tip? The tip should be where? I'm inserting this catheter, no? This catheter 
this tip should remain in which place very important so this tip should remain in tip must be in right atri right atrium or uh, in uh, uh, svc which is correct which is correct in atrium or svc it should not be in the atrium it should be in svc why if you keep this tip in the right atrium it can cause atrial thrombus it should not be in right atrium that is a mcq mcq is it should not be in the atrium it should be in the svc if you keep the tip in the right atrium for example in this image if you see the image is very clearly giving you the tip is in the svc if i keep the tip in the atrium it can form nidus for thrombus atrial thrombus can form that is a very important thing how to know whether i have kept in the svc or atrium is by taking an x ray chest so what are the uses of taking x ray chest so i have 300 slides to be shown so x ray chest what are the uses this is a remarkable rapid session so session may be going fast so those who have already prepared this will be very helpful those who are preparing new definitely you have to go through dr dorel's uh, uh, 16 hours or 18 hours rapid revision session this is a session only for those who have completed preparation and you are in a revision mode okay so x ray chest the two reasons are number 1 number 2 so number one reason is the number one reason the tip should be in the svc that is the main reason i am taking i want taking an x ray chest to see the tip in the svc another reason is to rule out pneumothorax very important most dangerous complication of central vein catheter is pneumothorax so dangerous complication of central vein catheter is pneumothorax please don't forget this but what is the most common complication procedure related most common procedure related complication this is very common but not to worry most common procedure related complication is so when i am trying to cannulate the vein i will enter the artery any nearby artery that is called as arterial puncture nothing to worry you take the catheter out and give a pressure for some time it will stop okay so when there is a arterial puncture you should take it out and we have to give a pressure so pneumothorax is most dangerous because it is not a normal pneumothorax it is a tension pneumothorax so tension pneumothorax you know very well it is going to be very dangerous we are going to discuss about it Yeah, we are going to go systematically. We'll be discussing every every topic, including hernia. So don't worry. Okay. So arterial puncture, puncture, most common procedure related complication is arterial puncture. So this is a picture based question again. It is an image based question showing you total parenteral nutrition. This is an image based question of total parenteral nutrition. You can see it is made up of three compartments. From the picture, you can see it is made up of three compartments. So this biggest compartment is sixty percent made up of dextrans. which are nothing but carbohydrates 20% made up of lipids which are nothing but fat another 20% is amino acids so we have three compartments in this so it is containing 60% carbohydrate 20% lipids 20% amino acids along with all the vitamins needed for one day all the minerals needed for one day all the electrolytes needed for one day everything is present in this tpn so everything is present in this tpn so any one any one uh, com compartment contain 60% dextran 20% lipids 20% amino acids and vitamins minerals and electrolytes all these are present in this tpn please don't forget so all these are present in this tpn this tpn will contain all these components and one day we need one tpn to survive so one tpn is needed per day okay this is very important and there is one another tpn known as fat free tpn this is a fmd question so fat free tpn is given for jaundice patients okay who will you give fat free tpn means please understand indications of fat free tpn so fat free tpn is a type of tpn which is given mainly for jaundice patients patients who are developing jaundice or patients who are developing fatty liver for these two patients you will give a tpn containing only two compartments that is major compartment containing carbohydrate which is how many percentage that is 75 percentage and 25 percent we contain protein so this is a compartment containing carbohydrate and protein in the ratio of 3 is to 1 is a repeat mcq what is the ratio of carbohydrate and protein is 3 is to 1 main reason is for fatty liver patients and jaundice patients they jaundice and the fatty liver becomes more aggravated if fat is added therefore fat is removed in the tpn bag but if sometimes many institutes we don't get this type of uh, uh, 
this type of fat free tpn especially in our government hospital setups we don't get this fat free tpn so what we used to do is we will cut out and we don't mix this see you can see here this is fat free fat tpn you know we will cut and take it out we take it out because these are separate compartments we have to roll it to make it one one lumen so we remove this and we only mix these two i can easily cut out and take this and only mix this two and infuse or else i can infuse this one this one like that also so but anyhow fat free tpn is indicated for people who are having jaundice or having fatty liver so basic question related to tpn and fatty liver so one of the same i am discussing the essential core topics which are being asked in the past 5 years so core topic number 1 is central line and tpn that is a core topic number 1 central line and tpn is a very important fmg topic so please go through this topic so whatever i have told you is very basic topic you should not forget okay so so now this is a picture based question again i'm telling you why why should i take an x ray after x ray cannulation is you can see the tip tip is in the svc and you can see this is right atrium so i have clearly taken a picture showing you the central vein catheter in the svc so this is an image based question this question will ask you what procedure is done here see fmg questions will be more practical and more basic if you, you don't need to go and read in depth more uh, in depth of all the management etc and all they will ask just simple question simple x ray what procedure done this procedure shows a picture showing you an x ray showing you tip in svc that's all normal picture of central vein catheter okay so now you know the very important second core topic is on the cannulas definitely there will be a question from cannula every year so cannula related questions will be definitely asked so please go through this question so there are various sizes of cannula the most common questions are 14 gauge 16 gauge 18 gauge so why i am telling this three are important because 14 gauge 16 gauge 18 gauge for surgeons for me this is three important cannulas because only this three i can use in trauma in a trauma cases i can use only three cannulas i cannot use smaller than that 14 g cannula is orange color okay please don't forget it is orange 16 gauge is gray 18 gauge is green so don't forget this three basic colors orange gray green in an orange cannula i can infuse 270 ml per minute in one minute i can infuse 270 ml of fluid in gray i can infuse 180 ml per minute in green i can infuse 90 ml per minute so this is the amount of fluid i can use in each cannula and in trauma i can only use orange gray and green so other three cannulas are only for medicine people they are for medicine case fever cases and all we will use this 20 for pink 20 gauge is pink cannula 22 is for pediatric ward so 22 gauge is pediatric patients blue and newborn ward it is 24 gauge is yellow so in newborn okay we use this newborn yellow cannula and we use blue cannula for pediatric and pink cannula for adults for infusing fluids iv fluids so a very important question what is the color of the cannulas and what is the ml of fluid you can use so if in a trauma patients in a trauma patients the minimum cannula used is two green please don't forget in a trauma patient i am resuscitating the patient uh, uh, the minimum two cannulas are used minimum two cannulas of green color is used so minimum two cannulas of green color if i am unable to put two green cannulas what should i go for next um you should understand you should not you should not you should stop reading superficially okay you should understand the concepts and read what so that, that is very important in fmg exam so if i am unable to put two green vein flan the patient is having collapsed veins because of the hypotension so what can i go for next if two green cannulas could not be inserted i can go for ijv central catheter in adults in ijv central catheter in adults please don't forget in adults i'll go for a two uh, one ijv catheter but in pediatric we should avoid the central vein as much as possible so in pediatric less than 6 years that is one interesting method of putting a cannulation what is it it is intraosseous root in tibia intraosseous root in tibia is the most important cannula which should be uh, it can be inserted so intraosseous root in tibia is a pediatric patients we can infuse the catheter into the intraosseous root so there are two methods of infusion one is pediatric less than 6 years and in adults 
IJV central catheter in adults and pediatric less than six years, you have to go for an intraosseous route of catheterization. So this is very important for your exam. Okay. Don't forget the cannulation related MCQs. Very good, Priya. Very good, Ashwin. That's your correct. Intraosseous route is used for children less than six years. Don't forget this basic question. So full ease catheter is another important topic for your exams. Similar to cannula, here also the color coding will be very commonly asked. So the color codes in full ease catheter, I want you to remember only three colors here also. So red is the biggest one used in humans. Okay, red is biggest one used in humans. Second is orange code. You can see the orange code. And the third is a green color code. So you can see the color codes here. Red, orange, green. So red is what is the size of Foley catheter, which is see gauge is gauge stands for okay, diameter of cannulas, but for catheter we don't use the unit of gauge. So uh, in gauge is a reverse unit. The big uh, smaller the number, bigger the diameter. You can see twenty four is thinnest thinnest diameter, whereas fourteen G is thickest diameter. So for gauge it is reverse numbering please remember gauge it is reverse numbering but for french it is normal numbering for example what is the size of green green is 14 french units orange is 16 french units red is 18 french units so please don't forget these three colors very important so 14 is green so please remember 14 French green is used in girls like that. Green is used for girls and orange is used for males. Okay, males, we will use orange and red is used for irrigating the red blood inside the bladder. That is nothing but TORP cases, TORP cases, transurethral resection of prostate for irrigation purpose. We use 18. So irrigation of the blood clots, that is a very important thing. So irrigation of blood clots, we will use this red. So red is used for irrigation of blood clots. Uh, orange is for uh, males and for French is for girls. So girls, we use 14 French for girls, 16 French for males, 18 French for irrigational purpose. Okay. So this is very important. Don't forget for your exam. So usually... There is no such size like 20, 24 and all we will not use because they are not human catheters. They are not used in humans. They are used in animals, not for humans. In humans, maximum, you can only pass red. That is the size of urethra. You cannot pass the bigger one and all. It's very difficult. We can, if you pass, it will cause damage of the urethra. Maximum in humans is red only. So there are many more sizes, but that and all, no need to remember because they are used by veterinary doctors, not by, uh, by us. Okay. So these are the two types of uh, Foley's catheter. This is Okay, what is this? This is one catheter. This is one catheter. This is latex rubber catheter. This is silicon catheter, white color. You can see the silicon catheter is white color. You need to change it every three monthly once you have to change. So once in a three month once, that's enough. Once in a three month, you have to change it in uh, those patients. So latex rubber is used monthly once. Uh, babies, you use this black, okay? Babies, you use 8 French black. Remember, B for babies. So babies, we can use, there are smaller catheters also, but I don't want you to uh, put so much uh, stuff at the last minute of exam. So 8 French black for babies, okay? This is for babies, very small diameter, okay? 8 French. So now, this is monthly once we have to change the latex rubber. Silicon, we have to change it three monthly ones. What is this French stands for? This is a repeat question. French unit stands for outer diameter of catheter. No, con no controversy. Outer diameter. This is a catheter I have cut means it stands for outer diameter. French unit stands for outer diameter. One French is equal to how many millimeters? 0.33 millimeters. That is a correct answer. 0.33 millimeter and otherwise one millimeter is equal to three French. So this values and all are very basic values for uh, practice and also just have an idea about one French is equal to 0.33, one millimeter is equal to three French. So Foley's catheter, FMG question. A patient comes to you with a retained Foley's. You have put a Foley's catheter for him. You are unable to remove it now. Retained Foley's catheter, how will you remove? How will you remove? Retained Foley's catheter is removed by 
ultrasound guided puncture of the balloon so you all know very well all the catheters have a balloon here you can see this is the balloon so this balloon is for self retaining purpose you all know very well this balloon is for self retaining purpose, purpose so that it will not come out so this balloon is filled with dash fill the balloon usually with a never use normal saline never use air you should only fill it with a distilled water okay distilled water is a fluid of choice to fill this balloon so with the distilled water you should fill the balloon and we have to not saline that's why i'm telling you saline should not be used if you use saline only it will get crystallized and blocked by channel not used don't use saline that is mcq normal saline or air should not be used so you should only use distilled water to inflate the balloon what is used is distilled water only okay so now coming to the most important so that is another important topic from the cannulas and the catheters now we are coming to the most high yield topics for your fmg exams that is suture materials suture material you should basically know the classification of suture materials so basic classification if you know you can answer 50% of the questions from suture materials non absorbable material and absorbable material there are two materials absorbable and non absorbable so absorbable can be divided into synthetic and natural material similarly absorbable is divided into synthetic and natural available material so please fill this table what are the naturally available synthetic materials naturally available absorbable material that is only one that is catgut that is only one that is catgut only one suture is available naturally available absorbable material that is catgut synthetic materials are poly glycolic acid poly lactic acid poly dioxanone poly glycaprone so these are four synthetic materials poly glycolic acid poly lactic acid poly dioxanone poly glycaprone okay so now absorbable synthetic materials what are the naturally available non absorbable materials can you tell me silk sari nylon sari all are sari material silk material nylon material or sari sari materials similarly synthetic sarees what are the synthetic sarees polyester sari poly butester sari i hope uh, girls will be knowing all the names of these sarees polyester sari poly butester sari silk sari nylon sari what are the other synthetic materials so other things are not available as sari materials but very important polypropylene poly propylene poly tetrafluoroethylene okay dacron all these are synthetic materials so all these are synthetic materials available now i am going to tell you one one mcq from each which are highly expected fmg exam questions from each suture material because this is very commonly asked as match the correct answer like that in ini set exams so question from catgut catgut is derived from dash yes what is it derived from catgut is derived from catgut is derived from sheep's small intestine submucosa everything is important catgut is derived from sheep's small intestine submucosa plain catgut is absorbed in 10 days chromic catgut absorbed in chromium coated which is chromium coated is absorbed in 60 to 90 days and since it is an animal material we stored in stored in what solution stored in isopropyl alcohol isopropyl alcohol is a storage material of catgut so catgut is a high yield topic it is derived from sheep's sub small intestine submucosa and please don't forget polyglactic acid polyglactic acid is what we call it as vicryl suture it's a, it's a commercial name company name vicryl which is violet color suture so it is also absorbable it is also absorbable by hydrolysis it is also absorbable by hydrolysis and it is absorbed in 90 days why why krail is very important because it is a workhas material workhas workhas means uh, what should what should i say in adimad adimad means the tamil word we used to tell who used to do all the works like an house surgeon in the hospital will be the house uh, 
will be the work cost. Like the work cost material is only lactic acid. So what are all the um, work cost means so many uses. What are the so many uses for bowel anastomosis, for bile duct anastomosis, wherever you want, you can use bowel, bile duct, muscle approximation, muscle closures, and for subcutaneous closure, subcutaneous fat. So wherever you want, you can use white So white krail is a workhorse material, direct line from Bailey. So they'll definitely ask you which suture is a workhorse material, means it is polyglactic acid. So bowel anastomosis is done with the help of three zero size of white krail. Pile duct done with the help of four zero size of white krail. So among the sizes, which is thinnest, you know, tell me three O, four O, which is smallest or which is fine diameter. Similarly, here you should not forget two O, zero, one. This is the decreasing order, okay? Five O, like that it goes on up to 10 O is the smallest. 10 O, like you remember when it comes as O, it is like minus, okay? So 10 O is the thinnest, whereas thickest is one. One is the thickest. So in humans, we use maximum thickest is one. Two, three are also available in veterinary hospitals. So maximum is one. So 10 O, 12 O, 14 O, 16 O, it is coming up. Very, very fine sutures are also coming up. So in bowel, we use three O. In bile duct, we use four O, four O sutures. Okay, please don't forget. Colic lactic acid is a very important high yield topics for your exam. And most important suture material is only dioxanone. This is a highly expected MCQ for NEET PG as well as for FMG exams because it is the longest absorbable material. Longest absorbable suture material is polydioxanone, which is absorbed in 180 days. It absorbs in 180 days. It takes 180 days to absorb. Very good, very good, Samuel. That is correct. So 180 days absorption period, polydioxanone is the longest absorbable material. But I will, if I am an MCQ setter, I will definitely ask only questions from polypropylene so i will like to ask question questions only from polypropylene because it is having totally eight mcqs it is having eight mcqs it is blue in color non-absorbable it is having an interesting property known as memory memory is a coiling property coiling property is good property or bad property so when I take it out of the box, it will go for coiling. So coiling is a bad property because the knot which I'm going to make is going to get loosened. So if the knot I'm putting, you know, that will lose. So that will lose. So therefore, coiling is a very bad property. So you should, you should be very careful with that proline. And proline is a monofilament material. That is also a bad property in the sense it has bad knotting property. Since proline is having bad knotting, the knotting is very bad. Therefore, I should make how many knots? I should make totally six to seven knots, which usually I will not make six to seven knots in other materials. I will make only three or four maximum. Here I will make six to seven knots. Very good. So polypropylene suture. I think all of you are very well prepared for the exam. I don't know why you need a revision session. So all of you are very good. Correct. So polypropylene, the most important MCQ I want to tell you here, it is used for hernia repair and for hernia mesh. Mesh is formed with the help of proline, hernia mesh, and this is very important for vascular suture. Vascular anastomosis is made with the help of polypropylene. Please don't forget vascular anastomosis, diaphragm repair, tendon repair, tendon repair. In all these places, I will use only this polypropylene. So hernia repair, vascular anastomosis, Diaphragm repair, tendon repair, in all these places, I will use only proline. So please don't forget, proline is a very important material in all these places. So these are very important points. You should not forget. Proline is a very important suture material. I'm telling you, now, if I'm going to be an exam setter, I will only add questions from polypropylene. Don't forget polypropylene as an exam question for your exam proline. And don't forget the work cars. Work cars is white gray. So this is a picture material showing you cat gut. You can see the color of the material is brown color. So they may ask you, the following is the property of this suture material, except like that the image-based question will come. And this is a question showing you violet suture material, which is white rail, workhorse material. You can see it is a workhorse material of sutures. 
and this is the memory property from the moment you see the suture you can see it is having the memory the memory is coiling property when you take it out other switches will fall flat this will go for back coiling so memory uh, very very basic question memory is a very important question memory is a property of rolling so please don't forget suture materials is an essential topic for your exam i request you please go through the suture material thoroughly and other suture material poly tetrafluoroethylene and dacron what are the one word mcq one mcq from each poly tetrafluoroethylene is are not suture materials that is a first important point they are not suture materials they are graft materials poly tetrafluoroethylene is a vascular graft this is a vascular graft so vascular grafts are made up of polytetrafluoroethylene dacron is an iota graft iota alone you should make with the help of graft so these are graft material so when you are making an arterial graft it is usually done with a ptfe but for iota especially for aneurysm aneurysm of iota we resect the aneurysm and we fill it no that is usually done with the help of dacron so don't forget these concepts of suture materials okay suture material is a very high yield topics for your exam so we are starting with the discussion on general surgery general surgery is discussion is going on so some of you joined late so we are going systematically general surgery trauma will be discussed next so general surgery repeated mcq what is this energy device this is a picture showing you monopolar diathermic artery so monopolar diathermic artery this is a monopolar diathermic instrument so you can see this is a machine through which this this instrument is connected like this this is a pencil and this is connected to a electrical current so electrical current is converted to heat energy so electricity is converted to heat energy on the patient lying on an ot table i am going to apply heat on that patient and i am going to have coagulation cutting properties cutting and coagulation properties are going to be done with the help of this probe with this probe i am going to cut the tissue i am going to coagulate the tissue by passing electrical current on the patient so now the patient will develop electrical burns if i am not going to keep the earth plate which will bring back the current to the machine so earth plate is mandatory in monopolar diathermy without earth plate the machine will not work so this is a monopolar cautery what is the use of yellow button yellow button blue button yellow for cutting blue for coagulation the major drawback of this monopolar diathermy energy device is if i am using on a tissue like this it will have extensive lateral spread of heat if i am using on my finger it will spread laterally forming so much of damage in the surrounding tissues so lat lateral damage is very common therefore it should not be used in contra indications of monopolar diathermy so where i should not use it in near nerves when i am operating near nerves don't use this like in thyroid and parotid thyroid and parotid areas i should not use in the thyroid surgery the parotid surgery and all i should not use this diathermy and end artery areas so end artery like penis finger tips in finger tips and in penis we should not use this because the end arteries can get damaged so near nerves and in end arteries you should not use it and in pacemaker you should be very careful using it not contraindicated in pacemaker keep earth plate away that is mcq keep earth plate away from the pacemaker but it is little dangerous little dangerous in pacemakers but the point is this is a pacemaker no so what will i do i should keep the earth plate away like this so in pacemaker we can use it but keep the earth plate away so old old textbooks were saying not to be used but a new edition says you can use it but keep it away so near nerves you should not use near end arteries you should not use in pacemaker use it very carefully so none of this problem is there when i am going to use a what is this this is bipolar diathermy bipolar diathermy the interesting point is this is also coming from a machine only so this is like a fork it's like a forceps so i will make the patient lie on the ot table i will use this and catch the bleeding point it will catch the bleeding point like this and the point is the current will come from here to here it will not spread laterally so there is no need of earth plate that is the mcq point so no need of earth plate in bipolar diathermy 
it is having only one property that is coagulation only no cutting so bipolar dichromy has only coagulation property and it is safe it is safer in any place you can use this even in pacemaker you can use you can use it in penis you can use it in finger tips wherever you want you can use bipolar dichromy is a safest instrument please don't forget it is safe safely used in any place it can be used safely in any place and this is an expected mcq for neat pg as well as for fmg exam this is an energy device shown here known as harmonic scalpel so harmonic scalpel device is going to function by connecting from a machine this energy device is going to convert like it looks like a scissor that is why it is known as scalpel it cuts precisely like a scissor here electrical energy is converted to ultrasonic waves so ultrasonic waves it works on the free principle of 50000 hertz high frequency ultrasonic waves are going to cut and coagulate precisional cutting that is that is mcq point precisional cutting it cuts like a scalpel blade that is why it is called as harmonic scalpel precisional cutting no lateral spread of heat or energy therefore what can i do i can use it in any place you can use again harmonic scalpel can be used in any place it is a precise cut there is no lateral spread of energy it's very important for your exam okay so this is the next important topic is on energy device is a high yield topic for fmg exams so what is this picture showing you so this is a picture showing you blood set used in uk what is it though it is not available very commonly in india this is a blood set used in uk known as so in india we use a blood set i hope you would have seen blood sets with a filter available in the iv set this is known as leukocyte reduction filter this is a last year aims question you all know very well when the question is asked in any set it can come for your exam so this is a leukocyte reduction filter which will red filter the wbc filter the wbc when i am doing blood transfusion why can anybody tell me i hope you have done in pathology most common complication of blood transfusion what is it most common complication if i do any blood transfusion i hope some of you would have seen blood transfusion would have done blood transfusion what is the most common complication that is if i am giving my blood for example this is my blood you are going to get this blood in your body if my blood is going in your body you are going to develop yes very good very good non hemolytic non this is a repeat mcq non hemolytic febrile reaction you are going to develop a fever but fever and chills but it is not due to wrong cross matching this fever is because of my wbc that is why i have a filter known as leukocyte reduction filter so my wbc will cause fever and chills in your body so therefore we will use a filter known as leukocyte reduction filter this is a picture of the filter so this filter will filter the wbc and will only set the rbc into your body that is known as non hemolytic febrile reaction but in india we, we this is not commonly available so what we usually do in our practice so immediately they put the as i start the blood the patient will have fever and chills i will inject what it is actually unconventional see many times what we practice in hospital will not be the correct method of treatment but what we do in practice is we will give avil and decadron chlorpheniramine and decadron will be given in our practice though it is not the ideal method ideal method is to use a leukocyte reduction filter it is always used in uk because they want to reduce the leukocyte reduction as well as it helps in another advantage what is another advantage it will also filter one more in uk it is there it is not there in india therefore they want to filter cjd virus i hope you know what is cjd which is not seen in india crutzfeldt jakob disease virus can be filtered by this filter it is an aims question so please have an idea this can just like that repeat so you all know very well any set questions will repeat in fmg so leukocyte reduction filter can also filter crutzfeldt jakob disease very good i think it's a prions in microbiology would have read it is not seen in india it is a crutzfeldt jakob disease virus can also be filtered by this this is an added advantage that is why in uk always they use this filter please don't forget they always use this filter in uk for this reason only so these are some images from aims i wanted to put those image that's correct darshan that's correct so what is this image it is a closed 
suction drain what is this this is known as what drain this is known as jackson pratt drain jackson pratt drain you can keep it in the abdominal cavity or any abscess so friend, this is not romovac i think i thought you know romovac and i have not put it so romovac will be different don't get confused with the romovac romovac bag will be like this like this it will be it will also have a suction like this so so romovac will be like a box will compress and leave it but this is like a globe hemi globe you compress and leave it it will suck the excess fluid so don't get confused between romovac drain so romovac drain is commonly available in practice jackson pratt drain is not at all seen in practice but for exam you should understand this image because this question is being asked in names so jackson pratt drain and romovac drain both are closed suction drains both are closed suction drains used in removing the excess fluid or drainage so these are closed suction drains they work on negative pressure technology please don't forget they work on negative pressure technology so any one drain can you tell me which works on this negative pressure technology this is an image based question for your exam this is a highly big, i i wanted you to understand this image that is why i put these two questions this is very important for exam for a uh, patients who are having uh, diabetic foot diabetic foot burst abdomen the abdomen got opened up in all these patients i am going to yes jackson drain is also inside the cavity jackson drain can be kept in the cavity or in the abdominal uh, cavity or in any abscess also you can keep so this is a picture showing you similar appear, similar usage like as negative pressure what is the name of this drain so when there is a raw area you can see i have kept a sponge like thing with a suction connected to it and an electrical suction it is known as vac therapy this is a high, high yield mcq for your exam vacuum assisted suction device vacuum assisted suction therapy so this vacuum assisted suction therapy is very important for you they will have a negative suction of minus 120 uh, pressure level it will be su uh, sucking the fluid so it will be connected to an electrical machine it will be connect sucking the fluid excess fluid excess pus whatever coming it will suck out and it will make granulation happen so soon so it will make granulation happen at a minus 120 negative suction pressure so don't forget this negative suction device vacuum assisted suck, uh, uh, therapy okay so now many positions in the ot this is the next important topic for from general surgery positions in ot so each position you should not forget from the moment you see the image you should tell me what position what surgery this position is called as very good this is this is not trendelenburg this is reverse trendelenburg don't get confused between trendelenburg and reverse trendelenburg reverse trendelenburg so reverse trendelenburg please remember head is up So these are all silly mistake. When you make it as Trendelenburg in the exam, it becomes a silly mistake. See, as FMG exam students, you should understand one important point. So most of the time, the problem happens when you make a silly mistake. If you are avoiding silly mistake, it is going to be definite, hundred uh, percent pass. Okay. So please don't make any silly mistakes. This is head up for any surgery in the head and neck, like thyroid, parotid. All these surgeries, we will make it in the reverse Trendelenburg. so that the neck veins will collapse and bleeding will be less what you are telling is this for varicose vein operation for varicose vein operation the leg should be up so remember varicose vein operation itself is known as trendelenburg operation trendelenburg operation is nothing but for what surgery it is a varicose vein surgery so varicose vein operation we will put the legs up that is known as trendelenburg operation okay trendelenburg procedure so this is trendelenburg in picture so what is this position so in this head up position one complication can happen one complication can happen very commonly that is the veins can get suck the air that can cause air embolism but air embolism is more common in another position this position okay this position is a position which air embolism is very common what is this position this is fowler's position neurosurgery done in this position you can see we do neurosurgery fowler sitting position 
the patient will be operated in a sitting position this position more commonly causes air embolism more commonly causes air embolism is foulus okay foulus causes more commonly air embolism and this position is called as jackson knife jackson jack knife or cracks position so this is jack knife position okay this is done for pilonidal sinus in pilonidal sinus we put the patient in prone with a jack knife position no need to know this name you remember only jack knife this is a jack jack knife is nothing but a thieves the roadside thief no they will have small knife in the packet when somebody is coming with the money they will show the knife and they will get the money no that small knife is known as jack knife okay jack knife position this position has a complication known as positional asphyxia positional asphyxia can happen in this position the surgery done is pilonidal sinus operation so all of you know this position this is a lithotomy position lithotomy position for any anal or vaginal surgeries this position has a complication known as what since we are putting the knee on a uh, uh, rod like this the nerve which is compressed here is common peroneal nerve compression can happen so common peroneal nerve can compression and the patients can develop foot drop yes for gynec surgery for hemorrhoids everywhere we use this so common peroneal nerve injury can cause foot drop so very basic question don't forget this and this is not important for you but it is an aims question a liard davies position liard day very good very good all of you are correct common peroneal nerve injury foot drop liard davies position so this is a position which there is head down with the legs are splitted leg split so this is done in laparoscopy if i i will stand from here and i will operate like this in the perineal area and this is known as liard davies position so liard davies position is head down leg split so laparoscopic pelvic surgeries are done by this position laparoscopically i will do pelvic surgery though this is too much for your exams just remember the name of the position liard davies position so most important is this position this is a very important position fowler's sitting position please don't forget this position so and this is a very funny question very commonly asked for lap cholecystectomy we will put a what position this position for lap cholecystectomy the position made see laparoscopic cholecystectomy i need a patient in head up position so i need the patient in head up position and sometimes we will lift the right side table up so head up right side of the table will be tilted up right side up so that the bowel on the right side will move to the left side and i can reach the calot angle right side upward tilt so this this is a very simple head up with the right side upward tilt is done for laparoscopic cholecystectomy see this is a very very basic position it's just with the help of position we can modify the surgeries many methods okay uh we are, we are going not we are going systematically so what is this knot what is this knot granny knot or square knot so don't forget granny knot is a knot which will slip so i used to remember it by simple method grandma will wear colorful sari and slip so don't understand it logically at this point of time when you become a surgeon you will understand this knots easily so grandma will wear colorful sari and slip so you can see at the crossing point here there are two different colors at the crossing point here it is red it is blue here so when there are different colors it is granny knot or slip knot when they are of same colors it is known as square knot or reef knot same colors at the crossing so don't get confused the moment you see within one second you can answer immediately so the topmost color is same color is square knot but the most secure knot is what secure knot is square knot please don't forget secure knot is square knot slip knot i will use in selected places which is beyond your level for your exam we usually needed for surgeons so please remember granny knot and uh, this knot okay very important grandma will slip and square knot is a secure knot okay most important thing don't forget this for your exam so granny knot is it's a slipping knot Okay. slipping knot repeat mcq slipping knot it will slip square knot is a reef knot so reef knot 
the most important not immediately you, we use as surgeons is surgeons not this is a picture showing you surgeons not in surgeons not the first throw is two throws so easily you can identify the first time we put is two times we roll you can see here i am rolling only one time when i am a surgeon i will use two times i will roll and on that i will keep a square knot i will finish off all the knots with only a square knot whatever knot i will put i will finish off finally with a square knot only so this is just remember this is a image of surgeon's knot don't forget this surgeon's knot so these are the questions uh, uh, you should not forget so in la uh, in lap laparoscopy we are not going to use these type of knots in laparoscopy we use a, a different type of knot there is no name for it we have a different type of knot in laparoscopic appendectomy that is not needed here so that is a different type of knot in in all in open surgery what are the knots we use is granny knot or slip knot or this is a uh, square knot or reef knot surgeon's knot you have to remember these knots only so don't worry about uh, which is used in laparoscopy that is not asked in your exam it will be different type of knot we have multiple uh, rolling and we have to slip it okay it is complicated knot there is no name for that you don't worry about it so triage now we have completed general surgery i am going to triage so uh, uh, different types of achalasia we will discuss when it comes so don't worry so triage means the meaning of the word triage means sort out sort out according to the severity okay according to the severity of injury if i sort out the trauma patients it is called as triage so within half an hour within half an hour i should treat a patient who is having red color batch example tension pneumothorax pericardial tamponade so pericardial tamponade tension pneumothorax these are red emergencies i have to treat them immediately okay i have to treat them immediately for those cases so this is yellow color so yellow color what is yellow color batch for yellow color batch is for second priority within 1 to 2 hours you have to treat them example open pneumothorax the femur fracture these are all cases we have to give a second priority yellow color green is a patient who is called as walking wounded don't ship them to hospital by yourself let them come to hospital by themselves that is a point so let them come by their own vehicle or by a uh, some some other method so don't ship them in the ambulance which i am shifting now because i need to give priority to the red and yellow so green is walking wounded a minor fractures like radial bone fracture and all will come in that so black don't ship them they are about to die dead and about to die we cannot save them even by shifting to hospital like a brain crush a crush injury of the skull so crush injury of the skull and all we cannot save them by shifting to hospital let them die peacefully in the spot itself by shifting them we will be compromising the life of another person so whom we can we would have saved example for example if i am giving more concentration on a black batch patient i would have missed a red batch patient who would have been saved that is why this priority or severity is made according to that color so red is given first priority yellow green black okay so what is this procedure shown here it's an image based question for your exam image based question of log roll in trauma log roll what is the purpose of log roll two reasons log roll is used for transfer of patient from one place to another place so for example i am going to transfer patient from this trauma spot to another place so i have to keep a stretcher underneath so i will log roll keep a stretcher and repeat log roll log roll okay that is number 1 transfer of patient to examine the number 2 to examine the spine so in cases of suspected spine fracture we cannot roll just like that one person cannot roll like that what will happen if i alone roll it the fractured spine will displace and will cause more damage so you examine the spine at the time all of you should roll back so this is a part of primary survey in trauma it's a part of primary survey in trauma so what all will come in primary survey so very very commonly asked fmg question please don't make mistakes in this basic question that is primary survey involves a for airway the moment you see a trauma patient you should secure airway b for breathing c for circulation management d for disability we have to put a glasgow coma scale here only disability 
E for exposure. Expose the patient. In exposure only comes log roll. So 28th edition Bailey and Love has added one more point. What is it? One more point. Thank you. One. So one more point is added in 28th edition Bailey. Anybody, what is one more point added? A for airway, B for breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. One more point is small c, not capital C. This is small c. That is control of exsanguinating hemorrhage. Control of exsanguinating hemorrhage is called as small c. Okay, don't forget this. Control of exsanguinating hemorrhage comes under small c. This is very important. So uh, transfer of patients, examine the spine, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. These all come in primary survey in trauma. So don't forget this point. It's very important for your exam. So log roll is very important for examining the spine. What is the 28th edition update? 28th edition Bailey says, no need of log roll. See, interesting point. No need of log roll nowadays. Because how many people are needed for this? We have to gather four people. Four people needed for examining the spine. So wasting of time in shifting the patient by four. We have to call four medicos there. Unwanted time waste. So to avoid wastage of time, whole body CT is used now. Very good. Whole body CT has replaced first log roll now. So therefore, there is no need to even know about log roll in future exams. It is totally replaced by whole body CT. The MCQ point here in log roll for FMG exam is log roll is was once was a part of primary survey. Don't forget, it is not a part of secondary survey. In secondary survey only, we will be doing investigations like CT scan and all will be done in secondary survey. So therefore, secondary survey we should not waste time on primary survey of doing WBCT. Uh, uh, doing this log roll and all, shift them for directly shift them for secondary survey CT scan. Okay. Head injury patient comes to you with the following sign. A patient with a head injury presents to you with the following sign. What is it? Yes, uh, this is a picture showing you. Whole body CT is a secondary. Whole body CT is now secondary survey. Okay. So we don't want to waste time on primary survey. Therefore, secondary survey stands for all the investigations, including whole body CT scan. So this is a picture of battle sign, repeated MCQ for FMG exam. Battle sign is bruising in the mastoid process. Bruising in mastoid process, it is due to fracture of which bone? Fracture of middle cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa injury, fracture in a, the in, involved bone is terion. Tyrion bone is fractured. So uh, not Tyrion bone, any, any middle cranial fossa bone, any bone in the middle cranial fossa, when it gets injured, there will be bruising seen on the mastoid process. This is a battle sign. It's a sign of base of skull fracture. So base of skull fracture, middle cranial fossa. So this is a very important, many times asked MCQ. If a patient had a head injury, he, fell, he was conscious for some period of time, suddenly goes back for unconsciousness. This is called as lucid interval. So when the word lucid interval comes, don't forget, it is characteristic of EDH. So lucid interval is a period of consciousness followed by unconsciousness. Consciousness followed by unconsciousness is called as lucid interval. It is EDH. Extradural hemorrhage will have middle meningeal artery injury. Middle meningeal artery injury. You get this. EDH. It is due to fracture of Tyrion bone. It is a part of temporal bone. Okay, It is a part of temporal bone. The Tyrion bone is damaged. And you can see here, there is a hematoma in a non-contrast CT scan. It is a non-contrast CT scan showing you EDH, nothing but biconvex hematoma. So what is the treatment of choice for this case? Treatment of choice is barrel evacuation. You have to put a bar roll and evacuate the hematoma. Okay, it is a good prognosis. Yes, very good. They have less than 1% mortality. So they have good prognosis. And this is the most common uh, type of head injury. Most common head injury is this. Okay, most common hematoma in the head is EDH. So this is a picture showing you concave convex hematoma like this. It is due to bridging vein tear bridging veins you had a severe trauma 
acceleration deceleration of the skull happens you go front hit and come back as you are moving inside the brain inside the skull will have a shake and the bridging veins are tarred leaking blood so loss of consciousness from the time of trauma okay loss of consciousness will be present from the time of trauma we need to do immediately craniotomy crani craniotomy should be done and we have to decompress the hematoma okay decompression is needed as early as possible mortality is very high mortality is around 40% in sdh so sdh is a dangerous case compared to edh okay we have to do craniotomy and evacuate the hematoma by the help of neurosurgeons this is a picture showing you what instrument this is bar hole instrument instrument used to open the skull by putting a burrow we have to put a tar rotation we have a hole like this this is a burrow instrument a very important point so please don't forget burrow instrument shown here to run it and open the skull so high yield mcq topic for your exams is intercostal tube intercostal drainage tube so intercostal drainage tube is a very important topic for your exam so please don't forget intercostal drainage tube so intercostal drainage tube is inserted usually inserted in fifth intercostal space mid axillary line this is a very important basic point you should not forget intercostal tube is put in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line but you should know as medicos you should know safety triangle of insertion of intercostal tube safety triangle is bounded anteriorly by anteriorly the boundary seen is what is the anterior boundary anteriorly pectoralis major okay anteriorly pectoralis major posterior boundary is by this is apex posterior boundary is by which muscle posterior boundary is by latissimus dorsi okay latissimus dorsi muscle inferior boundary we have to draw a line at the level of nipple level draw a line nipple level draw a imaginary line so this is classical pectoralis major latissimus dorsi nipple level you have made a triangle you can insert anywhere in this triangle but usually where we insert fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line we insert so what is the boundaries are anteriorly pectoralis major posteriorly latissimus dorsi inferiorly at the level of nipple we draw a imaginary line so this is a trapezoid triangle and the intercostal tube i am going to insert have some interesting points so this is the ribs serial order of the ribs so if i am inserting in the rib where will i insert will i insert in the lower border of the rib or upper border of the rib so these are the ribs means i should insert in the upper border of the rib i should enter the chest at the level of upper border of the rib why should i not enter lower border lower border will contain neuro vascular bundle like intercostal artery vein intercostal artery vein and nerve are present in the lower border so therefore when you are putting a tube insert it at the level of upper border of the rib so upper border of the rib upper border of rib only you should insert so once you enter the chest we have to connect the tube shown here this is the picture showing you the boundaries of safety triangle safety triangle of icd tube so the most important question is this is a picture picture based question what is this shown here it is intercostal drainage tube this tube will be inserted in the chest for example this is a patient i am putting this tube inside like this after inserting the tube the tube will be connected to a what is this i will be connecting it to a underwater drain i will be connecting it to an underwater drain so that the tube whatever connection the because chest is a negative pressure minus 4 atmosphere is 5 to 8 mm mercury so if i if i don't put it in underwater the atmospheric air will enter my chest so chest pressure is minus 4 atmosphere pressure is 5 to 8 so if i don't put the tube inside atmospheric pressure will en enter inside therefore to prevent air from outside going inside i should put it inside the bag like this so underwater drain so most important mcq now for fmg exams how to know the tube is in position or not how will i know the tube is in position i will look for what is this so this is a picture showing you the air and water column this air water column 
will be moving up and down for each breathing so air water column moves up and down so this is a very important point so air water column moves up and down means what it is in position it is in position not bubbles we never get bubbles all the time only in pneumothorax you will get the bubbles please understand in a hemothorax or in a pleural effusion at all you won't get bubbles so you should not look for bubbles coming out of the tube you will not get bubbles always only for pneumothorax you will get the bubbles therefore you should see this air water column up moving up and down i recently up uploaded this in my instagram this video of an icd tube see please follow my instagram surgery sixer there are two instagram one instagram i exclusively use to show smaller videos this is a instagram page surgery sixer having small small videos around 200 videos are there small small videos go through those videos that videos will help you to understand many concepts which you would have not seen in your hospitals okay this is air water column moving up and down so intercostal tube should be connected to a air water column that is very important okay so water level should be underneath it should be connected like this this is very important question for your exam so this is a picture showing you after putting a intercostal tube we always take an x ray just to see to see the tube is inside the chest you can see what procedure is done here this is a picture showing you an intercostal tube inside the inside the chest in correct position it is in correct position don't get confused okay it is correct position shown here in the image so they may ask you about this intercostal tube they may ask you what procedure is done here in the image so this is a picture showing you icd tube in position the many x ray questions will come for your exam i hope you have discussed them in radiology by dr kalil sir but anyhow some mcqs which are very important in uh, uh, surgery i have shown here you can if you want longer videos you can see my surgery you my youtube channel i have uploaded all the long videos but uh, uh, whatever i have up, up, uploaded in my instagram surgery sixer channel is enough for mcq purpose for exam purpose it is enough when you become a surgeon you can follow my youtube with the showing full videos so this is a picture two pictures are shown here can you tell me what is this what is this is not see there are few x rays which you should not get confused you should be very clear both are trauma cases okay trauma patients two trauma patients are coming to you with a breathlessness first picture second picture tell me what is first picture what is second picture very good very good discarded fusion that first picture is tension pneumothorax see you should not get confusion in identifying the x ray images please remember tension pneumothorax second picture is hemothorax on which side left or right this is tension pneumothorax right side the second picture is hemothorax on left side don't get confused in this so hemothorax it's not pleural effusion i have told you very clearly trauma case a patient with a trauma two patients coming to me with a breathlessness right side picture is a picture of right side pneumothorax okay why i am saying this is right side pneumothorax because you can see these are bronchovascular markings seen on the left side and you can see the mediastinum itself shifted to the right side so to the left side and you can see this is filled with air only air there is no bronchovascular markings this is pneumothorax some of you have confused and answered as air under diaphragm this air is not air under diaphragm it is normal fundus all of us will have fundus gas shadow that is shown on the left side don't get confused it is not air under diaphragm okay many of you will have uh, fundus gas shadow even if you take x ray so this is tension pneumothorax and this picture is showing you there is normal bronchovascular markings can you see on the right side so right side is normal left side is filled with the blood so because of the blood it look haziness haziness is seen on the x ray so there is no black black is air so there is no air yes this is very important so this is hemothorax in both the cases i should go for what if it is a tension pneumothorax what should i do if it is a hemothorax what should i do if it is a tension pneumothorax the next step that will be done is putting a wide bore needle wide bore needle like a 16 gauge needle like a gray one plan you can take and put it in which space fifth intercostal space mid axillary line in adults second intercostal space mid axillary mid clavicular line in children in children you put it in the mid clavicular line in adults you should put it in the mid axillary so fifth intercostal space in adults second intercostal space in children you should put a wide bore needle you should put a wide bore needle 
but this is not the treatment of choice it is only a next step so treatment of choice immediately plan for intercostal drainage tube in fifth intercostal space mid axillary line this is the definitive treatment uh, definitive treatment so you can differentiate the various types of pneumothorax only from the history so tension pneumothorax is commonly seen in trauma or due to rupture of bulla in an anesthesia when anesthesia is going on the rupture of the bulla present can cause rupture so tension pneumothorax will have a media channel shift you can see trachea shifted this side okay this is trachea shifted to this side heart is shifted to the left side so tracheal shift will help you to identify tension pneumothorax if there is no tracheal shift it is a normal pneumothorax that's all it is an open pneumothorax okay so this is a treatment for pneumothorax needle followed by icd tube whereas hemothorax what is the treatment of choice i am not going for treatment of choice what is done next so in a hemothorax next is intercostal drainage tube in fifth intercostal space mid axillary line is done next if the tube is showing more than 1.5 liters in blunt injury more than 1 liters in penetrating trauma of the chest what should i do next i am putting an intercostal tube as soon as i put that tube there is 1.5 liters blood is coming in the blunt trauma 1 liter blood is coming in penetrating trauma what should i do next i should shift the patient for thoracotomy please remember thoracotomy is emergency you have to shift the patient to thoracotomy for an emergency tube i have to put it in your chest so emergency tube i have to put for those patients don't forget this thoracotomy is done as an emergency so white bore tube inserted white bore needle inserted in first step in tension pneumothorax whereas in hemothorax i will directly go for an intercostal tube so no confusion in this concept of tension pneumothorax and hemothorax yes resuscitation is a part of all the cases you know very well airway breathing circulation as a part of that it will be done okay no confusion in that so definite mcq for fmg exam what is this picture showing you this is also a picture in a trauma trauma shows a patient having an image like this what is it yes not exploration laparotomy thoracotomy only exploration thoracotomy because it is major bleeding so some major vessel is bleeding so yes very good it is a fly chest Bailey and Love 28th edition has not updated this concept. What mistake it is given in Bailey and Love? So even if it is wrong, I'm telling you, even if it is wrong, you should only write what is there in Bailey. Don't go with the confusions with the various sources of materials. Bailey is wrong, but MCQ examiners will not know it is wrong. They will keep the same choice only. Bailey and Love 28th edition says three or more ribs fractured in two or more places that is what bailey says but what is the correct answer two or more ribs in two or more places is called as correct answer so this is atls correct answer but i will tell you this you cannot answer for your exams fmg exam all the questions are only from bailey so three or more ribs fractured at a time in two or more places this segment becomes a flail segment Plain segment means it will start moving by itself alone. It will start moving by itself separately. It will move up and down in a different manner that is called as paradoxical movement. Paradoxical movement in respiration. When I do inspiration, it will go inside. When I expire, it will come outside. That is called as paradoxical movement on respiration. Now tell me what will I do next? What will I do next for this case of flail chest? Please don't forget, next I will put an intercostal drainage tube because usually they have associated hemothorax. Then I will give them oxygen painkiller. So if the PaO2 is still falling less than 60%, I should go for a, another procedure known as IPPV. Ventilator should be connected if only if the PaO2 is falling. If PaO2 is normal, no need of ventilator. This is a very basic uh, MCQ. So please don't forget intermittent positive pressure ventilation should be done only when the PAO, PAO2 is decreasing. If PAO2 is normal, no need to connect for ventilator. This is a classical clinical viva question. The clinical, they will give you in the clinical question about the case and they will tell you PAO2 normal means just observe, nothing to worry. Intercostal tube, oxygen, painkiller, observe. They will become all right by themselves. Okay. So flail chest is a very important high yield topic for your exam. 
one more topic for your exam is tension pneumothorax so these are see whenever there is an endangering life of a patient in any clinical topic so what is fmg exam question fmg exam questions will be questions based on scenarios where there is a life endangerment in any patient either it's a medicine question or a og question or a surgery question wherever there is a uh, life risk for the patient that question will come as an mcq so please remember that question will come as mcq so tension pneumothorax is an interesting topic in which somebody has put a knife in the or a needle or a sharp instrument in the heart like this they punctured the heart and taken the needle out now what has starts going to happen this is the pericardium for every beat the heart is going to push some amount of blood into the pericardium so tension pneumothorax is due to penetrating trauma of the heart due to penetrating trauma into the heart the blood is going to leak out and going to cause a triad known as big triad big triad is raised jvp low bp and muffled s1 s2 20th edition bailey very clearly says no more needle thoracocentesis that is removed in new bailey so this is a new update in bailey that is why i wanted to discuss this topic pericardial tamponade there is no more needle thoracocentesis directly shift them for thoracotomy is directly uh, thoracotomy as early as possible so very interesting update in 20th edition they have removed the concept of pericardiocentesis yes all of you answered that only but it is wrong because it is a new concept most of your faculty should have taught it as pericardiocentesis but recently the bailey has changed it so no more pericardiocentesis it is given in bold letter in bailey now we have to go for thoracotomy only there is no role of pericardiocentesis in practice today in trauma this is a new update in 28th edition bailey please carry home this point for your exam okay if you have doubt you can verify bailey it is given in a bold letters about this changed concept what is this question shown here the name is no more fast it is known as e fast okay. extended focused assessment sonogram of trauma region number 1 so extended focused ultra focused assessment sonogram of trauma many of you will be confused it is not focal abdominal sonogram it is focused assessment sonogram of trauma i will examine liver one region spleen one region pelvis one region fourth region is pericardium for pericardial tamponade so for any tamponade effect we will see four so one is liver two is spleen three is pelvis four is tamponade the fifth one is right side chest left side chest is sixth one so totally six regions are examined six regions are examined for any injury the mcq will be what are the demerits of this demerits or disadvantages number 1 it cannot detect how much blood less than 100 ml blood on a e fast you cannot detect bleeding less than 100 ml it cannot detect penetrating trauma penetrating trauma it can detect it cannot detect bowel injury it cannot detect retroperitoneal injuries very interesting updates so retroperitoneal injury cannot be detected bowel injury cannot be detected yes that is cardiac tamponade please remember cardiac tamponade no more pericardiocentesis so needle pericardiocentesis that concept is removed now from new bailey it is a old concept So no more needle pericardiocentesis. It is abandoned procedure now. Okay, remember it. So E fast you cannot detect less than 100 ml blood. Not useful in penetrating trauma. Not useful in bowel injury. Not useful in retroperitoneal injuries. The only advantage is it is a fast investigation, non-invasive bedside investigation. So this is very important. E fast don't forget. E fast can detect many interesting findings are now. It can now detect. what pneumothorax pneumothorax can be detected by a e fast so what finding will be seen in e fast in pneumothorax yes this is a finding what is this finding so in your radiology books they will be saying this is barcode sign is abnormal 
So barcode sign is pericardial tamponade and seashore sign is normal finding. But ATLS says seashore is also a finding of pneumothorax only. Barcode sign or stratosphere sign is for pneumothorax. Okay. So please go through this pericardial tamponade and other important topics for your exams. You should not forget these essential topics in your exams. Okay. So now coming to the abdominal injuries. Abdominal injuries. Some interesting updates I want to tell you in abdominal injuries. In abdominal injuries, we have the following modes of injury. One is blunt injury of the abdomen. Another is penetrating injury of the abdomen. Another is seat belt injury in the abdomen. Then gunshot injury in the abdomen. Gunshot, somebody shooting in the abdomen with a gun. So now tell me what is the most common organ injured in each? Yes, blunt injury, the commonest organ is very good, spleen. Penetrating injury, liver, seat belt injury, mesentery, mesentery, mesentery tear is very common with seat belt. Gunshot injury, it is small bubble. So these are the most common organs injured in various cases. Okay. So first common is blunt injury, spleen followed by liver, spleen followed by liver. In penetrating injury, liver followed by stomach. Okay, liver followed by stomach in a penetrating injury. So seat belt injury, it is mesentery tear. It is because of the acceleration and deceleration. The mesentery gets teared. Which part of the bowel gets teared means it is DJ flexure. DJ flexure of bowel is second common injury in seat belt. If it is a bomb blast, bomb blast, which organ is first injured? Eardrum followed by lungs. If it is an underwater bomb blast, if the patient is in an underwater bomb blast, underwater bomb blast, the common organ injured is terminal ileum. Terminal ileum. These are all based on various uh, cases. Yes, inside the sea or inside a swimming pool, there is a bomb inside means it is underwater bomb blast. It is usually terminal ileum which is injured. Okay. So just have an idea about what are the common organ injured in various places. So don't forget what is a common injured organs in various places. And most importantly, I want you to know about the protocol in a blunt trauma of abdomen. So a patient comes to you with a blunt trauma abdomen. So blunt trauma abdomen, a patient comes to you now. What I'm going to do? What will I do next? I will do next A, B, C, D. That is a very important. So in a blunt trauma abdomen, patient comes to me, I will do airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. Next. Yes, I should definitely do E fast. E fast, I should do. If E fast is positive, if patient is stable, what will I do next? I should do a CT abdomen. I should do a CECT abdomen in a stable patient. If patient is unstable, what will I do? Directly shift him for laparotomy. This is the protocol. So don't forget this protocol. It is a repeat MCQ for your exam. A blunt injury protocol. So blunt injury protocol A, B, C, D, E. They are going for E fast. Patient is stable. Go for CT scan. Unstable. Go for laparotomy. So then coming for penetrating trauma. So this is a simple protocol. Penetrating trauma with a sharp object. Please remember, penetrating trauma with a sharp object, same A, B, C, D, E comes. There is no role of what? No role for E fast. Yes, any patient coming to you, you should do E fast first. Whether stable or unstable, you should do E fast. Please don't forget this. Any patient coming to you, first you should do is E fast. So there is no role of E fast in penetrating trauma. In a penetrating trauma, if patient is stable, are unstable, patient is unstable, peritonitis is seen or bowel is coming out, bowel out of the wound. What should I do? I should directly take them for laparotomy. Okay, unstable patients, peritonitis, bowel is coming out of the penetrating wound, you should take them for laparotomy. Stable patients, you should do local exploration of the wound. We should see whether the wound has gone inside or not. So local exploration of wound is done for stable patients. Put a local anesthesia and see how long the knife has gone. See, some of them will have this much of abdominal fat. 
the knife would have not even entered the subcutaneous tissue that much obese fellows the knife would have not entered the abdominal cavity it will be simple injury only so you have to do local exploration of the wound that's the most important first step so what should i do first means i should do local exploration of the wound in a penetrating trauma so don't forget these two protocols there will be definite mcqs from this two especially blunt trauma abdomen has been asked at least some 5 to 10 times in the last few years okay so now coming in that trauma last topic is on burns last topic is on burns uh, thank you this confusion thank you so this is a picture showing you first degree burns first degree burns is nothing but a burns involving only epidermis this involves only epidermis so first degree burns is a burns which goes up to the depth of only epidermis only up to epidermis so involvement only up to epidermis patients will have pain and erythema only so nothing to worry they will heal in seven days so most of you would have had this type of first degree burns you have pain and erythema involving only epidermis it will heal without any scar without any scar in seven days okay first degree second degree is a burns which has gone up to the dermis it has gone up to the dermis up to the superficial dermis or up to the deep dermis so coming up to the superficial dermis is known as second degree superficial burns second degree deep burns so please remember second degree superficial burns and second degree deep burns are the two types of burns shown here second degree superficial burns it has gone up to the superficial superficial part of the dermis second degree deep burns gone to the deep part of the dermis nothing but reticular dermis this is papillary dermis so now second degree superficial burns what are the features they will have painful blisters as shown here second degree deep burns will have second degree deep burn will have painless blisters but problem is many times when the patient comes to hospital the blisters will be broken so how to differentiate this now painful blister or painless blister will not be there most of the time when they come to hospital you can see one of my patient here the patient came to the hospital the blisters are already broken by the attenders by putting a bed sheet and rolling on the patient so therefore there is no blister how to differentiate what burn is it now we have to do some simple test like a pin prick test and a cotton touch so cotton touch and pin prick we should do both are normal in second degree superficial burns okay second degree superficial burns both are normal cotton touch is absent in second degree deep burns pin prick is present in second degree deep burns so this is a very simple method to differentiate how to differentiate these two i should take a cotton touch it and pin and pork it second degree superficial burns it is normal because the nerves are not destroyed whereas in a second degree deep burns the nerve starts getting destroyed you can feel the pin prick sensation but cotton touch is absent third degree burns is a burns which skin is completely gone we have gone fully into the subcutaneous tissue it is a full thickness burns third degree burns is a full thickness burns nothing remaining in the skin they have no pain at all they form an scar so please remember the more deeper the patient the patient will be silently lying so in your in any case you have a patient having no pain a patient had a burns and having no pain and silently lying means you should be very serious because it's a third degree pain as long as there is a pain in the burns patients are having only first degree or second degree third degree pains will have no pain and they are going to die okay they are going to die so no pain and yes scar see natural has made a situation where the person who is going to die is going to die without pain the third degree pains are very deep burns which is going to form an s scar and most of them will have no pain at all okay this is full thickness burns please don't forget this okay fourth degree burns are not seen in our hospitals they are seen mostly in mortuary involving muscles and bones okay uh so this is muscles and bones are involved in fourth degree burns very important please don't forget muscles and bones are burnt out in fourth degree burns they are mostly seen in mortuary so we are not to not worried about this so that completes the general surgery and trauma so the 50% of the fmg questions every year usually comes from general surgery and trauma so other systematic topics that are remaining 50% will be from the remaining chapters but 
uh, we can we cannot always say that because since we always say 50% from janasagri and trauma last year they asked, they asked only three four questions from janasagri and trauma most of the questions they have asked only from systemic topics so we cannot skip any system just like that we have to better go through all the systems at least uh, whichever important we should go, go through that okay so some of you want to know about the burns thing so burns thing i want to tell you related to the percentage of burns calculation okay so related to the percentage of burns calculation let me show you some basic points from the percentage of burns calculation so don't worry about rule of nine it is no more used that is a very important point rule of nine known as alexander wallace rule it is an outdated formula in fact it is used only in by the paramedical people plastic surgeons don't use this so it is used only by the paramedical people just for initial assessment it is not used by uh, surgeons okay so in this the percentage of burns is nine percent was given for head nine percent for upper limb nine percent for upper limb 18 percent for lower limb 18 percent for this up anterior trunk 18 percent posterior trunk 18 percent genitalia one percent this rule is not used now because it is not so accurate so it is not accurate for different category of people for example if i am drawing a baby this is a baby you can see the moment i draw the picture you can say this is a small baby because babies will have big head so it is not accurate therefore a new formula came known as lundan browder chart so lundan browder chart is a formula which uses different values for head thigh and leg they have different values for this according to age according to age of the patient head thigh leg values differ so this is a most accurate method to calculate the burns you need not mug up this because it is available in the k sheet as a printed format so from the k sheet it will be available for a printed format so lundan browder chart is a best for adults as well as pediatric not only for pediatric it is best for both adults and this is a most accurate formula okay this is most accurate formula and there is always a controversy related to fluid calculation in the burns so don't forget parkland formula parkland says the amount of fluid that should be given is not changed he is saying only 4 into weight in kilogram into total body surface area this is parkland formula of which half is given in 8 hours remaining half is given in 16 hours this is parkland formula half is given in 8 hours remaining half in 16 hours this is now modified by ATLS formula. Advanced Trauma Life Support formula says instead of 4, he is giving 2 into weight in kilograms into total body surface area. And to be frank, they have reduced the amount of fluid. From 4, they have reduced to 2. But you have to verify the question. If they are asking Parkland formula, you should go with 4. If they are asking ATLS formula, you should go with the multiplication of 2. Don't forget this. Even in ATLS formula, for age, for age less than 14 years, the value becomes 3 into weight in kilogram into total body surface area. And in electrical burns, the value is how much? 4 into weight in kilogram into total body surface area. Though these are too much for the exams, but have an idea, ATLS has reduced in adults. In adults, in a parkland, it is multiplication of 4. In ATS, it is multiplication of 2. In electrical burns, it is multiplication of 4 still maintained. So much of fluid needed for electrical burns okay so nothing mentioned in the exam you have to go only for i don't think they will not mention anything but if you are nothing is mentioned bailey and love answer is this bailey and love 28th edition says four into weight in kilogram into total body surface area you have to go with the bailey only for exams which is not mentioning anything if they are mentioning new formula atls formula go for two and what is the fluid of choice in burns fluid of choice is ringer lactate okay don't forget it is ringer lactate is a fluid of choice so identify the surgery shown here so please remember this is a picture showing you radical neck node dissection so one of the major surgeries for secondaries in the neck for cancer oral cavity with the secondaries in the neck this is a picture showing you radical neck node dissection what are the nodes removed? Level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Please remember, I hope you know the levels of neck nodes. There are seven groups of nodes. Submental, submandibular is level 1. 
upper jugular 2 middle jugular 3 lower jugular 4 posterior group is 5 six is pretracheal seventh is mediastinal so it's an anatomy question so you should not forget the levels of nodes removed are 1 2 3 4 5 Uh, submental submandibular one upper jugular middle jugular lower jugular posterior group all these nodes should be removed number one remove submandibular gland is removed number two submandibular gland removed part of parotid gland removed part of parotid gland removed and i also remove three important structures four five six is removed what is four spinal accessory nerve s c a n spinal accessory nerve internal jugular vein sternocleidomastoid so spinal accessory now internal jugular vein sternocleidomastoid is also removed preserve carotid artery you can see the carotid artery here vagus nerve lingual nerve hypoglossal nerve this is known as radical neck node dissection for cancer so why i am putting this is not for this Concept. I want you to know there is one more operation known as MRND, modified radical neck node dissection. So, what is modified in a modified radical neck node dissection? Which of the three structures preserved in this? I will preserve this three. Preserve three. That is nothing but spinal accessory now, internal jugular vein, and sternocleidomastoid. So, remember, SIS preserved spinal accessory now, internal jugular vein, sternocleidomastoid is. Preserved in another operation known as MRND. This picture is a picture of RND only, radical neck node operation. Because you have, you are not seeing the sternocleidomastoid muscle; it is removed out. You are seeing IJV is removed. You are having only parotid artery, vagus nerve, lingual nerve, hypoglossal nerve. Only these four structures are remaining. All the other structures are rem removed. So most of the applied surgery questions are applied anatomy questions only. So don't forget radical neck node dissection operation is shown here in this image. So this I'm now I'm going to the second part of the discussion that is head and neck thyroid breast. Okay. So what is the name of the incision shown here? The name of the incision shown here is Weber Ferguson incision. Weber Ferguson incision is a very interesting incision. You can see it runs along this below the eyelids. Close to the nose, up to the upper eyelid. This is done for cancer in this place. What cancer? Maxilla cancer or heart palate cancer. For heart palate cancers and for maxillary cancers, we do this Weber Ferguson incision. So please remember maxillary cancers and heart palate. Very good, Pravin. That's correct. So Weber Ferguson is a very commonly asked MCQ from Bailey and Love. The images. So let me show you some named incisions in the abdomen, which are very frequently asked incision names. Named incisions. I'm going to show you some named incisions. So what is the name of this incision for gallbladder surgery? What is it? It is Cocker's incision. Cocker's right subcostal incision for gallbladder. For gallbladder surgery. This is. Roof top incision, like a roof top. It looks like a roof top. On both side, it is extending, known as bilateral subcostal incision, called as roof top incision, known as chevron for pancreas surgeries. So, for pancreas surgeries, we put a roof top incision like this. And this is what is this incision? Looking like a Mercedes Benz, it is known as Mercedes Benz incision. Mercedes Benz incision shown in the image like this, like a diamond shaped. It is for liver surgeries, liver transplant, and all. We do this incision. All of you know the name of this incision. What is it? For gynec, fan and steel incision. A fan and steel incision. This is the umbilicus, and this is spinal umbilical line. In this line, if I am making a perpendicular incision like this for appendix, what is it? Perpendicular incision like this for appendix is known as MacArthur gridiron incision for appendicitis. For girls, this incision looks very ugly. So what we do in girls, we make a horizontal incision like this. 
so so that they will go along the sari line so it is known as lens horizontal incision so what are the various incisions shown in this picture are bilateral subcostal rooftop mercedes benz fan and steel and macarthur incision are the various incisions we use in abdominal cavity so please don't forget these names of the incisions macarthur are is also known as grid ion incision okay so don't forget at mcburney's point both are done at mcburney's point so the mcq i am going to tell now is highly expected mcq what is rutherford marison incision it is not a skin incision that is a very important point i want to tell you it is not skin incision it is a muscle cutting incision when i am doing for appendix it is a muscle cutting incision in which muscles cut what are the three muscles cut in this external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis three muscles are cut in that external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis are the three muscles cut in this external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis are the three muscles we cut in rutherford marison incision so please don't forget this is very important named incisions in the abdominal cavity don't forget this so in neck of the patient there is a swelling that is swelling is having pulsatile swelling in the neck pulsatile swelling present in the neck patient is having a pulsatile swelling which is having a consistency like a potato what is the diagnosis potato consistency is present and this is an angiogram showing you an interesting sign what is this yes rectus abdominis will not come in that incision rectus abdominis is in the middle see rectus abdominis is running here this is rectus abdominis rutherford marison incision incision i will make it like this here so this is rutherford marison incision so it will not include rectus abdominis mcq says external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis except rectus abdominis muscle okay so this is a sign showing you what sign is this very important this is known as chemodectoma also called as carotid body tumor carotid body it arises therefore it's place out the common the common carotid artery will go like this will branch like this but what happens because of the tumor the carotid artery is playing out like this known as liar sign this is a picture showing you splaying or separation of carotid artery splaying of carotid artery is known as liar sign this is a picture of liar sign the picture showing you splaying of carotid artery is known as liar sign and what should not be done in these patients don't do fnac or biopsy it will bleed please remember investigation of choice is angiogram if you do fnac or biopsy it will bleed like anything so don't do fnac or biopsy you should only do investigation of choice angiogram okay that's a very important question for your exam so please don't forget carotid body tumor is an next swelling which is pulsatile swelling so now coming to the one important investigation in thyroid that is radioactive iodine uptake study so radioactive iodine uptake study is a very important investigation in thyroid cases so that images are shown here all these are radioactive iodine uptake questions so you will get enormous questions from this radioactive iodine please understand this so radioactive iodine uptake is done with the help of two substances commonly iodine 131 and iodine 123 so iodine 131 and iodine 123 iodine 131 has an half life of 8 days iodine 123 has an half life of 12 to 14 hours so when i give this radioactive iodine substances they are taken immediately by the thyroid gland like this so they are taken by the thyroid gland so for example iodine 131 or 23 i have given it is taken by the thyroid gland and they emit beta radiation and they emit beta radiation so by emitting beta radiation we can use a, we can use a gamma camera and we can scan the thyroid now what is the physiological function of the thyroid that is known as thyroid scan see please don't get confused between thyroid ultrasound and thyroid scan this is thyroid scan which is a radio nucleotide scan used based on the thyroid scan done with the help of 131 or with the help of 123 i am going to scan the thyroid and that will show me enormous images it is used as 
diagnostic as well as as therapeutic two uses are there so therapeutically i will use 131 because it is long of life diagnostically i use 123 these are the images of diagnostic cases so in a radioactive iodine 123 if i use and i see a nodule which is not taking up it is known as cold nodule which is taking up means what that nodule is having high function increased functioning nodule which is secreting more thyroxine is called as hot nodule decreased function nodule is called as cold nodule so graves disease is a condition you all know very well the entire thyroid is increased function that is hyperthyroidism is called as graves disease so similarly thyroiditis is a condition which thyroid is not at all working which is having a hypothyroidism you have no uptake in thy hyperthyroidism there is increased uptake in hypothyroidism there is a decreased or no uptake so like that you can find out the function of the um, thyroid gland this investigations it is also helpful to find out ectopic thyroid it will help you to find out ectopic thyroid it will help you to find out metastasis so ectopic thyroid metastasis everything can be picked up with the help of iodine 123 so this is a treatment of choice it is a treatment of choice for number one graves disease and number two thyroid cancer metastasis answer is what thyroid metastasis and for graves disease the treatment of choice is iodine 131 ablation therapy so this patient you can see having multiple meds everywhere multiple meds everywhere so in spite of all these meds i can cure this patient by giving iodine 131 therapy in a high dose if i go give high dose of radioactive iodine it will go and destroy the metastasis so this is the treatment of choice for graves disease and for thyroid metastasis the only problem is it is contraindicated in whom so radioactive iodine cannot be given in pregnancy and in children pregnancy and children we cannot use this because it is carcinogenic so in, it is carcinogenic for the patients Pre pregnancy and children we cannot use this radioactive iodine study or uptake please don't forget this concept okay so very important point for your exam so here is another picture showing you a thyroid swelling moves with the protrusion of tongue what is your diagnosis so the thyroid swelling moves with the protrusion of tongue it is thyroglossal cyst usually thyroglossal cyst moves with the protrusion of tongue so the question for you in exams is what is the swelling moves with the protrusion of tongue is thyroglossal cyst it is seen in the midline and it is seen below the hyoid bone below hyoid bone it is seen but the question is what is the treatment of choice for this this is a repeat mcq for your exam what is the treatment of choice for this it is cyst trunk operation a cyst trunk operation is a treatment of choice what will you do in this cyst trunk that is the mcq in a cyst trunk operation please remember i will remove the thyroglossal tract this is the thyroglossal tract means i will remove it from the tongue to the cyst so from the tongue level, I should remove it fully. As I am removing it fully, I should also excise the, not the full hyoid bone. Please remember, I will only remove the central part of hyoid bone. Central part of hyoid bone is removed. Okay. I don't remove the full hyoid bone. I will remove only the central part of the hyoid bone will be removed in a thyroglossal cyst. So very important for your exam. So please don't forget thyroglossal cyst, central part of the hyoid bone is removed. Some basic questions from FNAC of thyroid. Some eight MCQs I'm going to tell from FNAC of thyroid. Please remember this. FNAC of thyroid, related questions. To say it is conclusive FNAC, how many follicles I should have taken? How many follicles, how many groups I should have examined? Minimum. To say this is a good FNAC, I should have seen six follicular group minimum there is a six group minimum each containing how many cells minimum each should contain at least 10 cells in each that is what we say as good fnac six follicular group each containing each containing 10 cells that is very important 
So each containing 10 cells, six follicular group is needed on an FNAC. On FNAC, I need six follicular groups, each containing 10 cells. MCQ number one. FNAC shows Hartel cells. What is your diagnosis? FNAC shows Hartel cells. That is Hashimoto's. The Hashimoto's. FNAC contraindicated. FNAC is not advised, not contraindicated. Not advised in which case? In Graves' disease, FNAC is not advised. You cannot get an adequate sample. Because of the high vascularity, you will not get adequate sample. FNAC not useful for whom? Follicular neoplasm. I cannot differentiate follicular benign and malignant. So benign and malignant cannot be differentiated in a follicular neoplasm. Because it is based on the capsule invasion. So, follicular neoplasm, I cannot differentiate benign and malignant. So, FNAC is not advised in Graves' disease. FNAC is not useful for benign and malignant lesions. So, very important. FNAC shows amyloid stroma. Where will I get amyloid stroma? It is in medullary cancer thyroid. Medullary cancer thyroid. Please don't forget. In medullary cancer thyroid, I will see an FNAC show me amyloid stroma. FNAC showing samama bodies. This is the FMG question, very commonly asked FMG question. Samama bodies are orphan anni nuclei. It is seen in papillary cancer thyroid. FNAC needle will not enter and it will break in. We have to go for true cut biopsy. True cut advised for. Because FNAC cannot enter, that is anaplastic cancer. In anaplastic cancer, I should go for a true cut biopsy. So please don't forget. So in anaplastic cancer, FNAC needle cannot enter. I have to go for a true cut biopsy. So what are all the various MCQ points? Hartel cells are seen in Hashimoto's. FNAC is not advised in Graves. FNAC not useful in follicular benign and malignant. Amyloid stroma, medullary cancer, thyroid. Some of my bodies are orphan and nuclei. True cut biopsy in anaplastic cancer. So please don't forget these points. Very important essential points in FNAC. So, which thyroid cancer produces osteolytic skull secondaries like this? So, you can see osteolytic pulsatile skull secondaries are seen in follicular cancer. Follicular cancer thyroid will spread very commonly by hematogenous route. So, hematogenous spread is very common and it produces pulsatile skull secondaries. So, pulsatile skull secondaries which are osteolytic in nature. Are osteolytic secondaries you are seeing in this picture. So, osteolytic skull secondaries are seen in this image. So, don't forget, very important for your exam is medullary cancer thyroid. So, medullary, I hope you all have gone through cancers. Medullary cancer thyroid, I want you to remember five important MCQs for exam. Medullary cancer thyroid is 80% sporadic, but 20% runs in families. What mutation is seen in 20% runs in families? What mutation? You can tell me what is the mutation seen in those families? Very good. They are seen in red oncogene mutation in men with syndrome. Men 2A, men 2B syndromes. All patients with men 2A and men 2B will develop medullary cancer. It is seen in red oncogene mutation. Men 2A, men 2B patients will have these cancers. So, medullary cancer, red oncogene mutation, men 2A, men 2B syndrome will have this medullary cancer. So, medullary cancer is a type of neuroendocrine tumor. Therefore, it secretes a lot of substances. That is number one, serotonin. Number two, calcitonin. Number three, CEA. Number four, ACTH. Many substances are secreted by medullary cancer. Okay, medullary cancer. So, we have to therefore test for calcitonin as a tumor marker in medullary cancer. Uh, men 2A, no, these patients are men 2A. Therefore, before going for surgery, since these patients have medullary cancer, patients may have associated second common tumor is pheochromocytoma. So, pheochromocytoma will be discussed in the endocrine topic. So, don't worry. Pheochromocytoma will be discussed in endocrine, but we have to do 24 hours urinary metanephrines for these patients. 
so urinary 24 hours urinary metanephrine should be done to rule out fear of chromocytoma so don't forget medullary cancer so 80 percent are sporadic 20 percent patients are familiar so we have to rule out fear of chromocytoma in these patients so treatment is treatment of choice for these patients is total thyroidectomy okay don't forget medullary cancer thyroid is a high yield topic for your exam the mcqs which are expected are it is associated with men to a men to b syndrome what is the tumor marker it is calcitonin and what is the second common tumor you should rule out is pheochromocytoma and the next mcq i told you already fnac will show you amyloid stroma don't forget fnac will show you amyloid stroma in these cancers okay so middle cancer is the very uh, least common cancer but you should not forget this basic point yes whenever you see patients with men to a men to b syndromes they will 100 percent risk is there so you should advise them prophylactically so before even the cancer happens you should do them prophylactic total thyroidectomy before even the cancer happens you should advise them to undergo prophylactic total thyroidectomy is advised for these patients okay so please don't forget medullary cancer patient should undergo prophylactic total thyroidectomy this is very important for your exam so now complications after total thyroidectomy complications of thyroid surgery so one important complication you have done a total thyroidectomy operation now you are going for a post operative ward rounds like this you are going for a post operative ward rounds in a post operative ward rounds the vp cuff is tied for the patient so a cuff is tied for the patient patient's hand is going like this what is this sign known as patient has toe stuck sign and trousio sign please don't get confused in this chowstuck sign is when you tap in front of the ears there will be twitching of the face trousio sign is carpopedal spasm so what does it mean chowstuck sign is facial twitching and trousio sign is carpal spasm what does these two signs imply these implies patient is having an occult hypocalcemia please remember it is occult hypocalcemia so immediately i should give the patient oral calcium oral calcium is given for those patients so if the patient is already when you are going for a ward rounds patient is lying like this what is this patient is lying like a curved arrow like is uh, curved like a um, thing like curved like this appearance known as opistotonus it means what patient is in tetany that means what patient is having a overt hypocalcemia it is a serious emergency what should i do for a over hypocalcemia immediately i should really give iv calcium so please remember complications of thyroidectomy so total thyroidectomy there will be chowstuck sign trousio sign means it is occult case we have to give the moral calcium chowstuck sign trousio sign nothing to worry just oral calcium is enough but when there is opistotonus like tetany immediately i should give a iv calcium gluconate what is the most common cause of these problems what is the most common cause of hypocalcemia in a thyroidectomy patient? It is because of loss of blood supply to the loss of blood supply to parathyroid glands. So loss of para blood supply to the parathyroid glands is a reason for this problem. So what test should I do means very important I will do in a case of post-operative surgery patients I will only do serum calcium serum calcium is very important serum calcium is done both ionized and non-ionized should be done in these patients so no need of testing for phosphate at this point no need of checking serum phosphate you can just only check up serum calcium and we will give only calcium only so phosphate is not essential in this case it is not essential in this case just remember we will only do ionized calcium and non-ionized calcium and we have to inject according to the clinical symptoms we don't even wait for the other reasons it is not due to removal of glands remember that it is due to loss of blood supply and not due to removal of glands so nobody removes all the four glands okay that much surgery not done one or two glands may be removed but that will not cause hypocalcemia removal of all the four glands is a very rare scenario most commonly it is due to loss of blood supply to the parathyroid glands okay so this complication is a classical question showing you post-operative hypocalcemia 
so they can ask you questions from post operative hypocalcemia in a case of total thyroidectomy cancers total thyroidectomy following cancer surgery okay so any doubts you wanted to know in thyroid because in thyroid thyroid as such is a very important topic you should go as much as possible into the thyroid topic and you should uh, spend more time on thyroid and breast so thyroid breast hernia why these three topics are important for fmg exam is very simple in indian exams the three commonly kept clinical examination case for final year students is thyroid breast and hernia so this thyroid breast hernia topics why we request you to read in depth related to anatomy surgical aspects everything because we, these questions will be asked more in fmg exams or because these are basics so when you read about breast cancer you should know everything about staging most important is staging tnm staging ajcc 8th edition so tnm staging ajcc 8th edition we have to discuss now very important for your exam tis t1 t2 t3 t4 see the only staging i request you to remember for exam is tnm staging okay tis is tumor in situ that is ductal cancer in situ and pages t1 is less than 2 cm t2 is 2 to 5 cm t3 is more than 5 cm t4 is further divided into a b c d please don't forget very important for exam t4a is what t4a is chest wall involvement what all will come in chest wall ribs intercostal muscles serratus anterior muscle what will not come that is mcq pectoral is major and minor will not come in a chest wall involvement uh, i think we will have up to 10 10 15 maximum so we will have uh, a continuation within one week i'll finish up the remaining topics don't worry so i'll ask when the channel is available for doing the session and we will do it. so pectoral is major and minor uh, at least we'll finish up to hernia today okay we'll finish up to hernia so pectoral is major and minor will not be included in chest wall t4b is what t4b is skin involvement skin involvement includes pud orange ulcer satellite nodules what is not included does not include following does not include fixity tethering retraction all these are not included retraction of nipple all these will not come in skin involvement okay t4c is both a plus b t4d is new update in bailey more than two third breast having what new update more than two third breast having pure d orange new update in bailey and love please don't forget this see don't think pure d orange means it will come in t4b so limited pure d orange will come in t4b more than two third of the breast having pure d orange will come here and t4d also includes inflammatory breast cancer that is a rare cancer so in t4d they have included pure d orange more than two third breast don't forget this this is t staging so n1 even last year they asked tnm staging so don't worry uh, i will make you simple t1 t2 t3 t4 less than 2 2 to 5 more than 5 so t4a chest wall t4b skin a plus b is c d is inflammatory cancer n1 is mobile axillary nodes mobile axillary nodes come in n1 n2 a is fixed axillary nodes so n2 a fixed axillary nodes n2 b so n2 a n1 is mobile axillary nodes n2 a is fixed axillary nodes n2 b is internal mammary nodes so internal mammary nodes n3 a is n3 a n3 b n3 c so n3 a is a condition in which um, n3 a is a condition in which there is infraclavicular node infraclavicular group of nodes n3c is supraclavicular group of nodes n3b is both infraclavicular as well as supraclavicular both infraclavicular as well as uh, infra supraclavicular are in fact both axillary nodes plus internal mammary nodes that is known as n3b so n3a n3b n3c so this is n staging okay n stage m1 is mets so here i want you to know only one important thing so there are three tnm staging ctnm ptnm ytnm 
what is the difference between these three c is what i have told you so far it is clinical staging p is not done by us it is done by the pathologist pathological tnm staging so why is a tnm staging done with a new adjuvant chemotherapy so after giving new adjuvant chemotherapy if i do a staging it is known as y tnm staging so please don't forget so new adjuvant chemotherapy it's y tnm staging so new adjuvant chemotherapy p tnm c tnm c is for clinical p is for pathological y is for new adjuvant tnm staging so this question is very commonly asked mcq for your exam so when you go for exam without breast cancer staging please don't, don't go inside definitely there will be some question in exam so fixed axillary node is n2a internal mammary node is uh, ipsilateral internal mammary node is n2b both internal mammary node and axillary node is n3b so now this is a picture based question showing you more than two third breast involved by PUTRH. Tell me what is the T TNM staging for this? What is the N staging for this case? What is the N staging for this case? There is an extensive PUTRH. More than two third breast is involved. So that is therefore T4D. So what is PUTRH? PUTRH means PUTRH means subdermal lymphatic infiltration. So you should examine the breast. You can see the breast is having more than two third of the breast with a pewty orange. So this is pewty orange showing you subdermal lymphatic infiltration. Subdermal lymphatic infiltration is called as pewty orange. Okay. So this is a core cut biopsy needle. What is the size of this needle? Repeat MCQ. What is the size of the needle used for core cut biopsy? Core cut biopsy needle size is 14 gauge to 16 gauge size is used for core cut biopsy needle so the size of the needle used for core cut biopsy because this is the investigation of choice in cancer breast in thyroid we will do fnac but in breast we will do true cut biopsy have you ever thought why we should not use true cut biopsy in the thyroid why i should not use this gun in thyroid if this will get more tissue no then why i'm not using this in the thyroid the concept is very simple if i use this it will take a core of tissue for example if i am entering inside like a tissue it goes and takes this core of tissue in the needle. If I am going to enter and take, I may injure the nerves in the thyroid. That is why true cut should not be done in true cut biopsy contraindicated in thyroid and parotid. In parotid and thyroid, you should not use this true cut biopsy gun. You can only use it in, uh, not for bleeding risk. Bleeding will not be there. Bleeding we can compress, but main reason is injury to the nerve. Thyroid and parotid, we may injure the nerve. That is why it is not done in parotid and thyroid. It is the investigation of choice in breast. Don't forget, this is the investigation of choice in breast. And we have enormous types of breast cancers like ductal cancer and lobular cancer. In ductal cancer, what is the most common type of cancer? Can you tell me what is the most common? In ductal cancer, the most common type is no specific type or Serous type. This is the most common type in ductal cancer. Lobular cancer, you should not forget, there is a picture showing you what appearance. The cells will be arranged in a row like this. Lobular cancer will show you what appearance is this. It is known as Indian file pattern. This pattern is known as Indian file pattern of arrangement of cells. So Indian file pattern of arrangement of cells, the cells will be arranged in a row. Okay. Mm, and there is a repeat question from the molecular classification of cancer breast. This is pathological classification, ductal cancer, lobular cancer. Molecular classification is there. I want you to remember luminal A type, luminal B type, basal type, and there is one more type known as HER2 type. This is based on Immunohistochemistry, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, positive is luminal A and luminal B. And HER2 positive, HER2 is positive in, is negative in luminal A and also it can be positive or negative in luminal B. Okay, in basal type, if you are negative, you will be in the base, all are negative. Remember, basal type is FMG question, which is having all negative, ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative. HER2 type, HER2 alone is positive, ERP are negative. So this question is a very commonly asked MCQ. Luminal A is 
ERPR positive here to negative is the best prognosis. Best prognosis is luminal A type and most common type is also luminal A type. Basal type is the worst prognosis. Okay, don't forget this question on, on this exam. So what procedure is going on here? It's, a, it's, a, it's an image based question directly image from Bailey. What picture is shown here? So they have injected some radio labeled colloid around the tumor and they are using a gamma camera and taking out the yes very good that is very good uh, this is sentinel node biopsy sentinel node biopsy image with a radio labeled colloid so the radio labeled colloid we are doing a sentinel node biopsy whichever node which are having high radioactivity we will take that node and we will send it for frozen section biopsy. So frozen section positive means we will do axillary dissection. I am going to show tell you what is axillary dissection. One of the major procedures, axillary dissection will be done. So the treatment of choice in most of the locally advanced breast cancers is modified radical mastectomy. So modified radical mastectomy, we are going to discuss few points from modified radical mastectomy. So modified radical mastectomy, please understand the questions. So in a modified radical mastectomy, the incision made is like this. What is this incision known as? It is known as Stewart's incision. The incision made is like an elliptical Stewart incision, including the tumor. Including the tumor, I will make the incision and I will remove level one level 2, level 3 nodes. This is MRM. So MRM is skin, nipple, areola, entire breast tissue. Please remember, entire breast tissue is removed along with the tumor, entire breast tissue, tumor tissue, along with the level 1, 2, 3 nodes are removed. So this is MRM. So what are all removed in MRM means? This is a picture showing you what are removed. You can see nipple, areola, skin, entire breast tissue, level 1, 2, 3 nodes, all are removed in MRM. What is preserved? Preserved. Preserved in MRM are A, B, C, D, M. Please don't forget this is preserved. A for axillary vessels. Axillary vessels, bells now, cephalic vein, now to latissimus dorsi, Spectral is minor, sorry, major muscle. So what are all structures removed means? The preserved and removed. This is a repeat MCQ. So what are structures removed in skin, nipple, areola, entire breast, tumor, level 1, 2, 3 nodes. We will preserve axillary vessels, bells now, cephalic vein. Now to latissimus dorsi and pectoral is major muscle are all preserved in MRM. So this is a very commonly done surgery. In this part of surgery, the most difficult step is removing the axillary nodes. So, removing the axillary nodes, you should understand the anatomy of axillary dissection. I hope you know the levels of axillary nodes. This is pectoral is minor muscle. So, pectoral is minor muscle. The nodes lateral to this pectoral is minor are called as level 1 nodes. The nodes which are at the level of pectoral is minor are level 2 nodes. Medial to the pectoral is minor are known as level 3 nodes. So now I am going to remove these nodes with one boundary. This is axillary vein. Axillary vein superiorly. This is bells now medially. Okay, medially bells now. This is thoracodorsal artery and vein laterally. Thoracodorsal pedicle laterally. And inferiorly we have a boundary that is angular vein. This is angular vein. This is called as angular vein inferiorly. So the boundaries of axillary dissection is a repeat uh, in INI said MCQ. Please remember the boundaries of axillary dissection are bells now medially. Okay, bells now medially, laterally thoracodorsal pedicle, inferiorly angular vein, superiorly axillary vessels. This is axillary vessels. So all the nodes in this area should be removed. Minimum nodes that should be removed is how much? Minimum of 10 nodes removed. In an axillary dissection operation, minimum nodes removed. You can see that whatever I told you is here. So you can see this is thoracodorsal pedicle. 
you can see the picture of thoracodorsal pedicle which contains thoracodorsal artery vein and nerve this is bell's nerve this is axillary vessel and inferiorly you can see angular veins so this is a boundary showing you the boundary of axillary dissection so now the basic question for fmg exam what is the most common nerve injured in this operation so most common nerve injured in this operation is dash what is the nerve commonly injured in this operation the commonly injured nerve in this operation is yes intercostobrachial nerve that is the most common nerve injured okay most common nerve injured in this operation is intercostobrachial nerve is the most common nerve injured so i want to tell you eight mcqs from most common nerve injured most common nerve injured in various surgeries one by one i am going to tell you so most common nerve injured in various surgeries one by one number one parotid surgery what is the most common nerve injured yes please answer the question let us see how much how many of you remember the points yes most common nerve injured in parotid thyroid breast all surgeries parotidectomy thyroidectomy mastectomy yes very good that is that correct facial now branch but not the facial now okay not the main now facial now branch is injured in parotid yes in thyroid yes thyroid very good eln breast intercostobrachial now parathyroid Parathyroid, what nerve is injured? Recurrent laryngeal nerve. Recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured in parathyroid. See, parathyroid, recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured. Yes. Pa parathyroid surgery, external laryngeal, recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured. Thyroid surgery, external laryngeal nerve is injured. No confusion in that. Okay. And in case of uh, vein, varicose vein stripping, varicose vein, long saphenous vein stripping, a varicose vein surgery, which now is injured medially, which now is injured laterally, short saphenous vein stripping, long saphenous vein stripping, saphenous now, very good, short saphenous vein stripping, sural now, okay, open hernia surgery, open hernia surgery known as Lichenstein mesh repair, what now is injured in a Lichenstein mesh repair? What surgery now is injured in lap hernia surgery, like tap or tip, transabdominal preperitoneal surgery. What now is injured in a open hernia surgery? Ilioinguinal now. Then lap hernia surgery, you should you should not forget L for L. Remember lateral cutaneous now. So that very good, a very good Kartika, very good Ankish. So uh, ilioinguinal now and lateral cutaneous now are injured in lap hernia surgery. So don't forget the various nerves injured in uh, various surgeries. Very important for your exam. So this is a patient. We are having a axillary dissection surgery. The most common nerve injured is intercostobrachial nerve injury. Okay. So don't forget the various nerves injured. I think you have missed submandibular gland surgery. Submandibular gland surgery. What nerve is injured? It is submandibular gland. Marginal branch of marginal mandibular branch of facial nerve it is also marginal mandibular branch of facial nerve so it is also a branch of facial nerve so these are the various nerves injured in various surgery so lap surgery lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh in a grid ion incision in appendix what nerve is injured grid ion incision in appendicectomy because of that nerve injury patients may develop right side direct hernia what is that nerve that is ilio hypogastric nerve Iliohypogastric nerve is injured in case of grid ion incision. Okay, don't forget this. So, this is a picture showing you a mammogram. Mammogram showing you what finding? Mammogram shows what finding in this picture. Can you tell me what finding is shown in the mammogram? You are seeing a popcorn calcification showing you a macro calcification seen in fibrodinum. So, it's a fibrodinoma picture of popcorn calcification. Repeat question. This is a huge tumor in the breast which is not involving underlying muscles or no node involvement. What is this? This is a fillots tumor. What is fillots? Fillots means leaf-like, a okay, leaf-like tumor. 
Pillards is a leaf-like tumor. The patient is having a huge tumor with a no lymph node involvement. So no lymph node involvement seen. It is a, it is benign. Mostly it is benign and very, very rarely it is malignant. So simple surgery is enough. No need of modified mastectomy. Just simple mastectomy or a wide local excision is enough. Wide local excision or simple mastectomy is enough for this fillard's tumor. It's known as fillard's because when you cut, it looks like a leaf. Okay, don't forget, it looks like a, a leaf. So with one more topic, we will stop today. We will discuss the remaining topics uh, from GIT. This is after 100th page, it is GIT starts. GIT and HBP, I will get the time from uh, uh, this channel and I, whenever it is free, I will do it on one another day. Okay. So we will finish with one more small topic, hernias. So hernias, so breast conservative surgery is usually uh, uh, INI set level topic. Very rarely they ask in exams. Breast conservative surgery is a surgery done for yearly breast cancer only. Yearly breast cancer means T1, T2. That's all. So cancers like T1, T2, they do breast conservative surgery. What they do in this case is for a cancer, very early cancers, they do a wide local excision like this. They do wide local excision of 1 centimeter margin. After removing 1 centimeter margin, they will give what is, what is the second step? Second step is radiotherapy to remaining breast. See, breast conservative surgery is made up of four steps. Number one, wide local excision, one centimeter margin, radiotherapy to the remaining breast, and number three, dealing with the axilla, axillary management. Axillary management means if axilla is involved, I should do axillary dissection. If no nodes are there, I should do sentinel node biopsy. If axillary nodes are positive, I should do axillary dissection. If no nodes are seen, I should do sentinel node biopsy. Then finally, I should go for follow-up. So this is completely known as hormone replacement. This is known as breast conservative surgery. So breast conservative surgery is made up of four steps. Don't forget that. Wide local excision, radiotherapy to the remaining breast. Number three, axillary management. Four is follow-up. All these together comprises breast conservative surgery, which can be done only for yearly breast cancers. We cannot do it for locally advanced breast cancers. We cannot do that. So here is a picture showing you an indirect hernia. So in they are asking very basic anatomy questions only from hernia. So indirect hernia is a hernia. I'm drawing the anatomy of inguinal canal. Please don't forget this anatomy. Anterior superior iliac spine pubic tubercle. This is pubic tubercle. Anterior superior iliac spine to pubic tubercle. This is the inguinal ligament. Okay, This is inguinal ligament. So don't get confused with this anatomy. This is a deep ring. This is superficial ring. This is inguinal canal which is only 3.75 centimeter length. From deep ring, this is superficial ring. And this is a muscle called as rectus abdominis muscle. This is rectus abdominis muscle. And this is external iliac artery. Okay, not femoral artery. I am drawing the external iliac artery from which this artery goes to rectus abdominis muscle. This is inferior epigastric artery. Now the anatomy is over. That's all anatomy. From this simple picture, you can understand the anatomy. What is this triangle called as? This is called as SL batch triangle. So please don't forget SL batch triangle. A cell batch triangle is a triangle bounded by rectus abdominis, inferior epigastric artery, inguinal ligament. Through which what comes out? Through which direct hernia comes. Through which direct hernia comes out. Okay. So this is deep ring. This is superficial ring. Through which what hernia comes out like this? Indirect hernia comes out. So tell me the course of indirect hernia. A hernia coming out of the deep ring into the inguinal canal, coming out of the superficial ring is called as indirect hernia. So through deep ring to superficial ring. SL batch triangle is a triangle with through which direct hernia comes out. So direct hernia comes out via the SL batch triangle into the superficial ring. So from superficial ring, it emerges out. So the inguinal hernia, two common hernias are direct and indirect. So this is a picture showing you a hernia which has come out through the 
deep ring and come out of the superficial ring you can see a very massive hernia which has come out like this and got obstructed so this picture is showing you irreducible irreducible indirect hernia in the image so they have asked few times the hernia images so please don't forget this image so boundaries of sl batch triangle are rectus abdominis on medially laterally inferior epigastric artery inferiorly inguinal ligament so this is inguinal ligament below okay so we have the inguinal ligament below the picture showing you inguinal ligament so this is hessel batch ring through which direct hernia comes out this is a classical anatomy of indirect hernia so in hernia most important is anatomy so if you know the anatomy you can answer most of the questions in an indirect hernia this is the anatomy now let me discuss with the same picture about the femoral hernia so this is anterior superior iliac spine this is pubic tubercle this is anterior superior iliac spine this is a inguinal ligament and this is rectus abdominis which i already have discussed this is external iliac artery this is external iliac vein continuing as femoral vein and this is a sheath you can understand this is a sheath this sheath is known as femoral sheath in this sheath this medial most compartment this medial most compartment this compartment is very important this compartment is made up of two openings what is this opening this is known as femoral ring below is saphenous opening so this canal very small canal 1.75 cm is a very small canal it contains a node what is the name of this node anybody what is the name of this node it is known as clockwise node or rosenmuller node so a femoral hernia how does it emerge out yes it will emerge out through this femoral ring comes out of the saphenous opening and turns up like this it is like this so femoral hernia course of femoral hernia is femoral hernia comes through femoral ring to saphenous opening then enters the canal inguinal canal it comes up like this so this is femoral hernia now tell me very important anatomy question it's not surgery question at all it is an anatomy question the boundaries of femoral ring this is femoral ring can you tell me what is seen anterior to femoral ring what is this anteriorly you have inguinal ligament medially what is this ligament this is a repeat mcq what is this ligament lacunar ligament posteriorly what is this ligament so lacunar ligament medially posteriorly we have cooper's ligament cooper's ligament and laterally we have femoral vein so what are the call uh, boundaries anteriorly inguinal ligament medially lacunar ligament posteriorly cooper's ligament laterally femoral vein this is the boundaries of femoral ring okay this question is a anatomy question so these are anatomy questions for your exam so this is a picture showing you a femoral hernia in a very old age femoral hernia is very common in females femoral hernia is most common in females and you can see the picture showing you the hernia coming out like this and turning like this so it has come out of the femoral ring saphenous opening and turns like this so it is therefore having a retard shape so fem femoral hernia is retard shape hernia retard shape so now the question is how will you do what surgery is commonly done for these hernias the common surgery i want you to know for your exams is lichenstein mesh repair so all the named surgeries are very important especially in surgery one of the important surgeries lichenstein mesh mesh free repair this is conjoint tendon this is inguinal ligament so please remember this is inguinal ligament i have drawn before and this is rectus abdominis what is conjoint tendon made up of anybody what is conjoint tendon made up of conjoint tendon is made up of two muscles internal oblique plus transverse abdominis muscle conjoint tendon is made up of internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscle and i have to keep a mesh like this between conjoint tendon and inguinal ligament this surgery is known as 
like and steel mesh repair. A mesh is kept between conjoint tendon and inguinal ligament is called as like and steel tension free mesh repair. This is the mesh shown here. It is a mesh made up of proline mesh. This is a mesh used for hernia repairs. So this mesh is kept between conjoint tendon and inguinal ligament. So please don't forget. Um, in urology, I will discuss. Don't worry. I have actually I have so many questions to be discussed in GAT, HBP. So we'll be discussing because it will take another two hours definitely. So welcome back, friends. Uh, today we are going to start with uh, GAT and HPP and urology related topics. So I, I hope you all have watched the part one session. So this is part two session. So welcome all. So the image shown here in the image, what is this image? Okay, what is this image shown here? This is an image showing you esophageal pressure topography, okay, EPT. Please remember, this is an image from Bailey and Lowe. This image is known as EPT, esophageal pressure topography. This is a graphical representation of one in investigation. What is it? It is an investigation I'm going to do. That is, yes, it's a graphical representation of high resolution manometry. Okay, high resolution manometry. It is a study of the physiological functions of esophagus. The physiological functions of the esophagus is studied by one investigation known as high resolution manometry and this image is an image of high resolution manometry graphical representation please remember the name is esophageal pressure topography EPT it is called as EPT so here you can see this is the EPT image you can see as the patient is swallowing for example the patient is swallowing a sip of water that water is going inside the esophagus it will show the various functions of the good evening all so let us move on to the topic so the esophagus as you swallow the food particle it is moving in the esophagus the movement in the esophagus is given by a graphical representation called as high resolution manometry that graph is called as esophageal pressure topography please don't forget this is the gold standard investigation for Yes, it is a gold standard investigation for what? Investigation of choice for achalasia cardia, diffuse esophageal spasm, nutcracker esophagus. In otherwise, it is an investigation of choice for all motility disorders. Motility disorders of esophagus. This is the investigation of choice. So nutcracker, DES, achalasia for all the cases, it is the investigation of choice. What you are seeing here is a normal esophageal pressure topography i don't think in uh, fmg exam they will be asking you the questions of various ept images but they may ask you what is this investigation so this is an investigation known as esophageal pressure topography which is a graphical representation of high resolution manometry so this is the les shown here this is a lower esophageal sphincter which is shown in this image so in achalasia you can see there is a tight les which will be shown with the high pressure so this is a simple question please don't forget this concept okay so based on this investigation high resolution manometry we have a classification known as chicago version 4.0 from new bailey chicago version 4.0 is a new bailey question so please remember it is divided into hypomotility and hypermotility disorders so hypermotility disorders are des and nutcracker esophagus Usually for FMG exam, they will not be going into the manometry findings of that. Hypomotility disorders are called as achalasia cardia. So there are three types of achalasia cardia. As per Chicago classification, it is a finding based on manometry. Okay, it is a finding based on manometry. Please remember type 1 achalasia, type 2 achalasia, type 3 achalasia. There are three types of achalasia. Type 1 is a commonest type called as classical achalasia classical type 2 is also called as vigorous vigorous but that name is not mentioned in new uh, edition just remember it is vigorous type 3 is spastic spastic achalasia so i have to find out the various findings in manometry from this picture so number one i will look for the peristalsis in all the three i will be seeing for the peristalsis peristalsis is absent in Peristalsis is absent in all the achalasias. There is no peristalsis in any of the achalasia. 
please remember it is absent in all the achalasias and lower esophageal sphincter pressure is given by a new term in bailey please remember that term is called as integrated relaxation pressure integrated relaxation pressure that is a, a new term used in bailey known as irp integrated relaxation pressure that is nothing but when you swallow the les pressure should be normally how much normal les pressure should be less than 15 mm mercury then only the food will go inside if the les is not opening with the pressure is more than 15 it is seen in all the cases more than 15 mm mercury more than 15 mm mercury and more than 15 mm mercury see what is the difference then all of them are having same finding peristaltic is absent in classical vigorous spastic les pressure is high in classical vigorous and spastic then what is the difference the difference stands in one interesting concept from bailey and love that is known as pan esophageal pressurization pan esophageal pressurization is a value please don't forget it is a measuring the esophageal intraluminal pressure inside the esophagus there is a luminal pressure so that pan esophageal pressurization is absent in type 1 achalasia it is not there in type 1 achalasia it is always present in type 2 achalasia means what there is a increased intraluminal pressure inside the esophagus there is high pressure that is why it is called as vigorous it is called as vigorous because intraluminal pressure is high in type 2 in type 3 it may or may not be present please don't forget in type 3 it is may or may not be present it is present or may be absent spastic achalasia there is segmental segmental pep present in some segment only there is pan esophageal pressurization present whereas in a type 2 full length full length of the esophagus has pep full esophagus has high pressure so this is actually a term replaced from 27th to 28th edition there is one term removed in new edition that is dci so no need to remember dci so distal contractile integrity is a term removed in new edition so definitely they may not ask you this question because dci is not used in version 4.0 in version 4.0 they are not going to use dca so irp is the most important concept here irp is increased in all the cases in type 1 type 2 type 3 in all the cases there is failure of relaxation under tight les so type 1 there is no pep type 2 there is full length pan esophageal pressurization type 3 there is segmental pan esophageal pressurization therefore which is the most common most common as classical best prognosis is type 2 least common as type 3 so achalasia cardia uh, various types are very rare questions for fmg exam but please have an idea about the version uh, 4.0 chicago classification of motility disorders so various motility disorders are categorized under this if at all the examiners will maximum ask you this achalasia cardia only so please remember achalasia cardia and this is not the investigation of choice i'm saying many times students go for uh, investigation of choice as this this is known as barium swallow showing you birds beak appearance okay birds beak appearance or pencil tip appearance so birds beak or pencil tip appearance is a uh, finding seen on barium swallow but it is not the investigation of choice Hey, okay, please remember, it is not the investigation of choice. It is done. That's all. It is not the investigation of choice. And new update in Bailey says one syndrome known as Algro syndrome. So Algro syndrome is a new update in Bailey, twenty eighth edition. Uh, that is, it is made up of triple A syndrome, three A syndrome, A for achalasia, another A for adhesions, uh, adrenal insufficiency, adrenal insufficiency. so achalasia cardia adrenal insufficiency and the patient has a lacrimia so you expect the question from 28th edition bailey since it's a new new point in bailey so they may ask you in the in the new question 
Al Guru syndrome, either it may come in FMG exam or NEET PG this year, highly expected. New update from Bailey and Love. Al Guru syndrome. So please don't forget what is the treatment of choice for achalasia cardia. Treatment of choice for achalasia cardia is modified LS cardiomyotomy. LS cardiomyotomy is a treatment of choice. So what are the other procedures that can be done? Though they are not the treatment of choice, you should know. Balloon dilatation can be done. Balloon dilatation of the LES, Botox injection of the LES, all can be done with the help of simple endoscopy. What is a new procedure done for achalasia? New recent update. Yes, what is a recent update for achalasia cardia? Anybody? Yes, that is a treatment now for DES, nutcracker, everywhere we are using that. That is OM, peroral endoscopic myotomy. Is a recent update for very good, very good uh, location, very good Dr. Russell, that is correct. So the recent update is OM, peroral endoscopic myotomy is a new update for achalasia cardia. So that's a new question. So what is this image showing you? This, are, this is a repeat uh, question from FMG exams. Barium swallow shows what finding? Showing you a corkscrew esophagus. It's an image showing you corkscrew esophagus. It is a disease diffuse esophageal spasm. It is seen in diffuse esophageal spasm. So please don't forget. Now, recent treatment of choice for diffuse esophageal spasm is what? Recent treatment of choice from 28th edition Bailey, it is POEM. So POEM is found to be beneficial for uh, DES. So DES is a patient comes to you with a chest pain and a dysphagia. Chest pain plus dysphagia. So they won't have, not, they don't not only have dysphagia, they will also have chest pain and dysphagia. Please don't forget, this is a classical image of nutcracker esophagus. Sorry, DES, nutcracker esophagus, nutcracker esophagus patients will come to you mimicking like MI. They mimics like MI. They come to you as if they have developed a myocardial infarction. So mimics like MI, nutcracker. Whereas DES will come to you with a chest pain along with the dysphagia. Okay. So, so most both DES as well as nutcracker, both of them will have chest pain. Both of them will have chest pain. Worst chest pain is very severe chest pain is seen in nutcracker. Okay. Nutcracker esophagus. So here is a girl undergoing one simple test. What is the simple test shown here? What is the simple test shown here? Yes. What is the simple test shown here? You can see this is a gold standard investigation for GRD. So we are going to keep a sensor through the nose and we keep the sensor via a catheter above the OG junction. This is a OG junction. Above the OG junction, we keep the sensor and connect it to a receiver. So now the patient is going to have acid reflex. Every time when the acid strikes the sensor, it will send a signal to the receiver. So this investigation is called as 24 hours ambulatory. Please remember the word ambulatory. Ambulatory pH monitoring. This is an investigation known as 24 hours ambulatory pH monitoring. So this girl will come to you morning 8 o'clock. And next day 8 o'clock morning, we have to do this test continuously. That, that will be sending the signals to this receiver. And what is the prerequisite to do this test? Prerequisite to do this test is the girl should not take PPA for seven days. Seven days before the procedure, they should not take pantobrazole because it will stop the acid production. Therefore, um, the stop PPA for seven days before and that acid reflexing and uh, touching that at a pH of less than 4, if it touches the sensor, we get a signal. And with the help of this, we get a scoring system known as d meester score. The score is called as d meester score. When it is more than 14.7, it is confirmed case of GRD. Okay, It is a confirmed case of GRD. So 24 hours ambulatory pH monitoring will be definitely asked as a uh, theory question or as a MCQ. So please don't forget d meester score more than 14.7 is called as GRD. Okay. So you have to see for the number of times the reflex is happening. So very important. So the number of times the reflex is happening is counted and it is a score derived based on this d -mister score. So this is a 24 hours ambulatory pH monitoring. In one another problem in GRD, that is laryngopharyngeal reflex. It is a type of GRD. 
laryngopharyngeal reflex that as it is going to reflex into the lungs in such cases i will keep a sensor just below the cricopharynx another sensor so two sensors will be kept and two receivers will be used that is known as that is the investigation of choice for laryngopharyngeal reflex 24 hours dual probe ph monitoring that is called as 24 hours dual probe ph monitoring so please don't forget that is another old mcq from neat pg so what is the investigation of choice for lpr type of grd it is 24 hours double probe ph monitoring so now a young female comes to you with the dysphagia a middle aged girl okay a middle aged female coming to you with the dysphagia with the dysphagia she is having history of asthma okay history of some allergic asthma is there she is having dysphagia i am doing an endoscopy what is this finding i am doing a barium swallow what is this finding yes what is the case this is a case known as eosinophilic esophagitis it is an eosinophilic esophagitis eosinophilic esophagitis this is a case of eosinophilic esophagitis this patient on endoscopy has trachea like esophagus esophagus is looking like a trachea on endoscopy if you see the esophagus has a rings and looks like a trachea and barium swallow shows what finding here it is showing alternate black and white lines like a feline cat i hope you all would have seen a feline cat so feline cat is nothing but the domestic cat with a line on the body like this so lines black and white lines you know that cat is called as feline cat so this is feline esophagus but both of them are not the investigation of choice for eosinophilic esophagitis so investigation of choice for eosinophilic esophagitis is biopsy endoscopic biopsy shows more than or equal to 15 eosinophils per high power field so in per high power field i am having 15 or more eosinophils that is the investigation of choice so please don't forget eosinophilic esophagitis will have trachea like esophagus on endoscopy will have a feline appearance on barium swallow but what is the investigation of choice means endoscopic biopsy is the in the investigation of choice which will show more than 15 eosinophils per high power field so please don't forget 15 or more eosinophils per high power field is seen on this finding okay so eosinophilic esophagitis is a very favorite mcq for national board examination examiner so this can come for your exam so treatment of choice for eosinophilic esophagitis is we have to give topical steroids topical steroids are used and we have to go for ppa ppa may be beneficial in many of the patients so topical steroids and ppa don't use uh, systemic steroids we have to just use steroids which can spray in the esophagus like a oral uh, uh, solution like steroids are used which will act in the esophagus as a topically they don't need to go for systemic absorption so this question is already a repeat mcq endoscopy shows punched out ulcer endoscopic finding of a patient coming to you with a dysphagia there is a punched out ulcer what is it punched out ulcer is seen in yes punched out ulcer is seen in where yes very good very good uh, herpes simplex virus so hsv will have this punched out ulcer i hope you all know the other types of ulcers in the esophagus this is punched out ulcer seen in the esophagus and you can see a serpentine ulcer in the esophagus serpentine ulcer in the esophagus seen in cytomegalovirus it is also called as geographical ulcer geographical ulcer seen in cytomegalovirus like a like a snake so geographical or this like like a snake like ulcer there is one more ulcer in the esophagus which will be seen on both sides simultaneously this side as well as this side what is it it is known as kissing ulcers kissing ulcers kissing ulcers are seen on opposite opposite side in the same level it is due to new update in bailey pill induced esophagitis pill induced esophagitis sometimes what happens many people they swallow the tablet and they don't drink water that tablet will go and adhere to the esophagus and form an erosion forming ulcer on both sides that is known as pill induced esophagitis or kissing ulcer not ebv it is kissing ulcer is from bailey and lau due to pills serpentine epstein uh, cytomegalovirus 
So this is a classical image in an immunocompromised patient having a white curdy patch. White curdy patch on endoscopy is seen in candidiasis, esophageal candidiasis. So candidiasis has this type of white curdy patches. So esophageal candidiasis, very commonly seen uh, problem, esophageal candidiasis. So don't forget these images. And another interesting image for your exam from uh, Bailey and Love repeatedly asked, this question has been asked at least 100 times. So a patient coming to you with an abdominal pain, uh, vomiting, what is this? Yes, very good. It is a hollow viscous perforation. It is a case of hollow viscous perforation showing you air under a diaphragm. You can see here there is air under a diaphragm. That is showing you air under a diaphragm. The air has come from the bowel. Okay, the bowel from the air has come out from the bowel and is showing you air under a diaphragm. So now question is a patient coming to you with a perforation peritonitis. How are you going to manage? So protocol in perforation peritonitis patients. So as there is a perforation, the contents from the bowel is coming out. So contents from the bowel is coming out and causing perforation peritonitis. So most common cause of perforation peritonitis is duodenal ulcer perforation. And duodenal ulcer perforation is seen in anterior wall ulcer. Ulcer in the anterior wall of duodenum will have a perforation known as perforation peritonitis. How I am going to manage this? Perforation peritonitis. It is a very commonly asked uh, essay question in Indian exams. Perforation peritonitis management. When a patient comes to me with a perforation peritonitis, clinical examination findings are guarding, rigidity. There will be guarding and rigidity, and patient will be having septic shock. Patient will be in septic shock features. So immediately next to done investigation is what. Next done investigation is X-ray abdomen erect. So X-ray abdomen erect will show you air in only 50% sensitive. Please remember, Bailey says in only 50% of the patients, they will have air in, on an erect X-ray. So many radiology MCQs are there from air under diaphragm. So this is one sign looking like a mushtak, air looking like a mushtak called as cupola sign. That is known as cupola sign air looking like a mushtak and if this is the bowel bowel containing air inside and air outside this is called as double wall regular sign regular sign or double wall sign there is one more sign looking air looking like a football huge amount of air looking like an american football sign that is called as football sign so cupola sign, regular sign, football sign, all these are various signs of air under a diaphragm. But whatever it is, air will be seen only in 50% cases. So therefore, what is the investigation of choice for these patients? Investigation of choice, 95% to 100% sensitive is CECT abdomen, which is 95% sensitive. So once it is confirmed, you should be on the other hand, you will be resuscitating the patient with IV fluids, Riles tube aspiration, antibiotics, all will be going on another side and shift the patient for surgery. What is the surgery done for perforation peritonitis? Surgery is emergency laparotomy. So emergency laparotomy, we have to wash the abdomen, lavage and close the perforation. If this is the perforation, how will I close the perforation? I will close the perforation with a omental patch that is known as modified Graham's omental patch. Please don't forget, this is a very commonly asked FMG question. Modified Graham's omental patch is the procedure of choice for very good, uh, very good. It is not known as anastomosis, it is just closing it. You have to close the hole with a modified Graham's omental patch. So, this point you should not forget. So, modified Graham's omental patch is shown here. This is a picture of modified Graham's omental patch. So this is done for perforation peritonitis. So perforation peritonitis is a very important topic for your exam. So please don't forget this. So can you tell me, coming to the cancer stomach, what is the name of this classification? So nowadays, they're asking so many images of classification in FMG exam. So classification images they are giving, and they're asking, what is this classification known as? 
So some of the important named classifications I want to tell you here, that is number one, Bormann classification. So Bormann's classification is a classification for cancer stomach. Okay, cancer stomach. Can you tell me where is Lorentz classification used? It is also for cancer stomach, but Lorentz is a classification of microscopy. Microscopy based classification. Bormann is macroscopy based classification. So macroscopy based classification is Bormann. Lorentz is microscopy. So last year they asked a question on Todani classification. Where is Todani classification used? Yes, Todani classification is a classification. They give the image of the classification and they'll ask you what is the classification known as. Todani is yes, colidocal cyst. Colidocal cyst in the liver. Number four, what is the place where I use a classification known as Strasbourg classification? Strasbourg classification is a very commonly asked neat PG topic. It is used for bile duct injuries. Bile duct injuries. And last year they asked for FMG exam bismuth correlate classification. Bismuth correlate classification. Can you tell me where is this bismuth correlate classification used for? It is used for very commonly asked MCQ bile duct cancer. Bile duct cancer. Like that, they are asking images of the classification and they are asking what is the uh, classification shown in the image. So, therefore, I am giving you an image of my patients. So, what is the name of this classification? It is a classification known as Bormann's. Bormann's cross classification type 1 you can see that is a polypoidal type of cancer you can see the polypoidal type of cancer type 2 you can see ulcero proliferative type of cancer ulcero proliferative type of cancer you can see here an ulcerative type of cancer in your exam they will be asking what is type 4 Bormann's type 4 Bormann is a repeat FMG question that is Linitis plastica, looking like a leather bag. That is a commonly asked question. So, Bormann's classification, polypoidal, ulceroproliferative, ulcerative. Type 4 is a repeat MCQ, linitis plastica. Okay, linitis plastica will be very commonly asked in your exam. So, please don't forget, linitis plastica is a contracted, shrunken stomach. Okay, shrunken stomach is called as linitis plastica. And Lawrence classification is based on microscopic examination. On examination by microscopy, the classification is known as Lawrence. In these two types are there. What is the finding in diffuse type? Diffuse type has cells like this. What is the name of these cells? Diffuse type on microscopy shows what type of cells? Signet ring cells, like a signet ring cells are seen. The diffuse type has worst prognosis. Worst prognosis, it is seen in young females. It is associated with one mutation. Can you tell me what mutation this diffuse gastric cancer is associated? E. cadherin mutation. It is associated with E. cadherin type of mutation. So the type of mutation seen in diffuse gastric cancer is E. cadherin mutation. Intestinal cancer is what we are always seeing in practice. Intestinal cancer is well differentiated cancer. It is associated with environmental risk factors. Environmental risk factors are positive in this type of cancer. So, intestinal cancers will have environmental risk factors like what smoking, spicy foods, salted foods, such pylori, all these are associated with intestinal type. It is common in old males. It is having good prognosis compared with diffuse type. It is having Good prognosis compared to the diffuse type. So it is common in older males and it is having a better prognosis than uh, diffuse type. So diffuse type, very commonly asked question, what is the mutation associated? It is E. cadherin mutation. When there is E. cadherin mutation, we advise them prophylactic gastrectomy for those patients. We will even advise prophylactic gastrectomy for those patients who are having this E. cadherin mutation. Okay, please don't forget E. cadherin mutation. So very frequently asked question from stomach chapter that is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. 
so hypertrophic pyloric stenosis once upon a time it is called as congenital now it, it is known as idiopathy they don't know the exact cause so old and old name is congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis now the new name is idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis in which the circular muscle of the pylorus please understand this is a circular muscle of pylorus becomes hypertrophic by fourth week not at birth at birth the baby is fine for one or two weeks the baby is fine but after after fourth week the pylorus becomes hypertrophied and the baby comes to you with what type of vomiting non bilious vomiting okay the baby is coming to you with the non bilious vomiting because of vomiting 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 the baby develops electrolyte imbalance of hypochloremic hyponatremic hypokalemic and hypo calcemic metabolic alkalosis the baby is going to develop this electrolyte imbalance this electrolyte imbalance is a repeat question so what is electrolyte imbalance seen in goo or in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis so hypochloremic hyponatremic hypokalemic hypocalcemic metabolic alkalosis some babies can even develop paradoxical aciduria paradoxical aciduria can sometimes develop in these babies so it is a non bilious vomiting seen in these babies when i take an x ray i will see a finding known as single bubble appearance so single bubble appearance is seen on x ray barium meal shows what sign barium meal will show mushroom sign like this mushroom sign on barium meal but investigation of choice is what investigation of choice is ultrasound of the abdomen that is the investigation of choice and treatment of choice is shown in the image that is what finding what is very good uh, most of you are very much strong with the exam preparation i think most of you are answering correctly so this in the treatment of choice is ramsted's pyloromyotomy ramsted's pyloromyotomy that is the treatment of choice for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis so some of you have mentioned in the discussion double bubble so please remember the other bubbles so double bubble appearance in the x ray triple bubble appearance in the x ray are also congenital problems congenital problems double bubble is duodenal atresia please don't forget double bubble is duodenal atresia jejunal atresia will have triple bubble appearance in a newborn baby having multiple air fluid levels what is the cause a newborn baby is having multiple air fluid levels immediately after the birth the baby is having multiple not triple bubble having many air fluid levels the common problem in this case is mal rotation of gut so it's a more serious case when there are many bubbles it is a serious case because mal rotation of gut the baby is going for a mid gut valvulus so what is the surgery done for mal rotation of gut or mid gut valvulus very commonly asked neat pg question what is it it is lats procedure so lats procedure is a procedure done for mal rotation of gut say i am telling you the causes of obstruction in a newborn baby in a newborn baby single bubble pyloric stenosis double bubble duodenal atresia triple bubble jejunal atresia and multiple bubbles think of a patient with intestinal obstruction yes duodenal atresia is also same feature like annular pancreas both of them will have double bubble appearance and some of you are asking fluid of choice yes fluid of choice in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis yes it's a repeat question please don't get confused ringer lactate should not be used we should use only normal saline with a kcl supplement so what is the fluid ideally should be used in congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is or any case of goo any case of goo fluid of choice is normal saline with the kcl supplement okay don't use ringer lactate there is a big mechanism which cannot be explained in a crash course uh, it is normal saline please remember at this point of time so a old lady an old lady comes to you with a melina okay old lady comes to me with a melina and anemia so i am doing an endoscopy endoscopy shows an interesting finding shown here what is it yes endoscopy shows an appearance like a watermelon stomach yes very good it looks like a watermelon antrum what is the diagnosis the what antrum looks like a watermelon it is cave very good cave gastric antral vascular ectasia it is gastric antral vascular ectasia shown in the image 
So the treatment of choice for this case is what? What is the treatment of choice? This old lady needs a treatment. She is daily bleeding small, small amount. So what should I do that for? I should go for a, yes, what is the treatment of choice? Argon plasma laser. Argon plasma laser should be used for coagulating the dilated vessels. Argon plasma laser coagulation is a treatment. Very good, Priya. That's correct. So it is argon plasma laser coagulation is a treatment of choice for these patients. Okay. So repeated FMC question. What is the diagnosis from the image? Image-based question. Image shows a very interesting finding of diverticulum. It is Meckel's diverticulum. Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum. Please don't forget that. Basic point, it is a true diverticulum. It is congenital. It is seen in 2% individuals. It is a persistence of persistence of vitellointestinal duct, of proximal vitellointestinal duct, not distal. Okay, proximal vitellointestinal duct is Meckel's. That Meckel's in this image has gone for gangrene. That is the image you are seeing here is a gangrene of the Meckel's. So what is the most common problem with this means? Meckel's in children will have associated, what is this? Ectopic gastric mucosa. So ectopic gastric mucosa may be seen in the adjacent bowel. So ectopic gastric mucosa will get peptic ulcer and it will go for bleeding. So that bleeding is the commonest complication of children. Common complication of Meckel's in children is bleeding. So what presentation the children will come to you? So children will come to you with the bleeding as a common complication. Whereas this ectopic mucosa is absent in adults. It is absent in adults. Therefore, adults will come to you with the intestinal obstruction. That is what you are seeing in this image. So adults will come to you with an intestinal obstruction as the most common presentation. So bleeding is a common complication of children. Adults, it is intestinal obstruction. Yes, it is having a rule of two in adults. So rule of two is 2% 2 individuals, 2 inch length and 2 feet proximal to ileocecal junction. So 2 feet proximal to ileocecal junction, you have Meckel's. So please don't forget what is the treatment of Meckel's and in management of Meckel's. In children, investigation of choice for Meckel's is technetium 99M scan. So that scan will show the ectopic mucosa. That is a classical investigation of choice in children. Whereas in an adults, I cannot use this. In adults, the investigation of choice is small bowel enterocleases. Giving a contrast into the small bowel, I will do an investigation known as <coughs> enterocleases. Yes, technetium 99M pertinates scan in children. And in adults, it is small bowel enterocleases. Because in children only, they have ectopic mucosa. So we will do this. Whereas adult, there is no ectopic mucosa. Therefore, in adults, easy. Management is also very easy. I can only resect the meckles like this. I can do a wedge resection like this. Whereas for a children, I need to go for a resection anastomosis of the adjacent bowel. Because if I do a wedge resection, if the ectopic mucosa is there, it will be missed. Therefore, in children, always I should do resection and anastomosis. Okay, resection and anastomosis is mandatory in children. Whereas for an adult, just wedge resection is enough. Okay, there is no need to worry in adults. So this is an image showing you technetium 99M pertinate scan in children. Showing you a Meckel's from Bailey and Love. This is an image from Bailey and Love showing you Meckel's diverticulum. So please don't forget what are the ectopic mucosas in Meckel. Most common is gastric mucosa. Ectopic mucosas in Meckel's. Ectopic mucosa most common is gastric. Second is pancreatic, then colonic. These are the three mucosas commonly seen in Meckel's. Gastric is the problematic person which will cause all the issues. So intestinal obstruction can be due to many reasons. Can be due to many reasons like uh, intersusception or valvulus or diverticulitis. Many reasons are there, but commonest is intersusception. It will go inside and cause the intersusception. So can you tell me what is the procedure shown here in this image? There are two procedures shown here in the image from small bowel chapter. We are going systematically, esophagus, stomach, small bowel, I am going systematically. So what is this image shown here? So you are seeing a picture here in which the bowel 
is now split into two and bowel length is increased so this picture first picture is bianchi procedure bianchi procedure so i already told you there are so many images are coming from the operative images so bianchi procedure and this is step procedure name the operation shown here is there two surgeries are shown here both are done for a syndrome known as short bowel syndrome this is short bowel syndrome where the bowel length is less than 200 cm due to some surgeries so most common cause of short bowel syndrome is crohn's disease so from bailey and now the answer is crohn's disease please remember very good uh, patricia that is bianchi procedure is a procedure done for short bowel syndrome another procedure is step procedure both are known as bowel lengthening procedures because the bowel length is now less than 200 cm so i want to increase the bowel length so that the patient's nutrition will be absorbed very well so please don't forget bianchi step procedure are the two procedures we have to do for short bowel syndrome the two images are shown here you can see we split the bowel and we make that it one loop of bowel into two loops and we anastomose them like this so it is now uh, for example if it is a 50 cm and this is made into 50 plus 50 and now the bowel has become 100 cm so this is bianchi procedure so the kimiura procedure and all will not be asked for fmg exam so just don't worry about it you just remember these two procedures bianchi and step procedure okay step procedure are the two procedures used so now coming to another in interesting topics that is hirschsprung disease what is hirschsprung tell me the basic pathophysiology of hirschsprung tell me what is pathophysiology of hirschsprung pathophysiology of hirschsprung is you should understand there is this is a git this is esophagus stomach small bubble very commonly asked fmg question so just understand this this is colon and this is a rectum and this is anus see in any patient in any patient there is one interesting point there is embryologically descent of this what is this descending down what i am drawing is embryologically there is neural crest migrates neural crest migrates as meesner's plexus and arbach plexus in the bowel wall it is uh, descending down like this at one place it stops arrest of arrest of migration of neural crest arrest of migration of neural crest results in a physiological obstruction from here onwards actually there is Uh, no organic obstruction it is physiologically there is absence of ganglion cells so absence of ganglion cells in arbach plexus and meesner's plexus since there is uh, uh, absence of ganglion cells in arbach plexus and meesner's plexus this part of the bowel becomes dilated like this this part of the bowel becomes dilated like this so the bubble you can see becomes dilated like this it is called as mega colon congenital mega colon so congenital mega colon is now called as hirschsprung disease can you tell me what mutation causes this problem very common mcq so there is absence of ganglion cells in arbach and meesner's plexus of constricted segment dilated segment is normal please remember though it is normal dilated part the dilated part is normal which part of the bowel is abnormal in hirschsprung disease it is a constricted part of the bowel because beyond which there is no proper ganglion cells absence of ganglion cells result in this what mutation causes this it is red oncogene mutation so please don't forget red oncogene mutation causes this problem so it is caused by red oncogene mutation and it is associated with men 2a syndrome so what is the investigation of choice for this so these are not the investigation of choice it is a barium enema showing you constriction this part of the bowel constricted these babies will come to you with the constipation and dilated bowel okay with the mega colon constipation with the mega colon these babies will come to hospital so what is the investigation of choice is a repeat mcq for fmg exam hirschsprung this is what is the investigation of choice what biopsy it is full thickness rectal biopsy 
it is not biopsy it is full thickness rectal biopsy above the dentate line above dentate line of anus we should take a full thickness biopsy and in a newborn babies i cannot take full thickness biopsy so i will take take a suction biopsy because rectum itself will be only half centimeter i cannot go and take full thickness biopsy so i will take a suction biopsy in newborn once i confirm it i have to go for treatment of choice is what i have to resect the constricted part and i should do pull through operations what are the name of the pull through operations name the pull through operations done for ishpran that is duhamel swenson swayer are the three pull through operations done for this very good uh, duhamel swenson swayer three types of pull through operations are done by various surgeons so please don't forget duhamel swenson swayer are the three types of pull through operations we do for ishpran disease so very commonly as mcq a patient comes to you with a diarrhea they will give a simple image patient comes to you with a severe diarrhea on and off bleeding presence of aptus ulcer in the mouth and you are doing a capsule endoscopy this is a picture showing you capsule endoscopy shows there are multiple lesions in the small intestine so capsule endoscopy of small intestine shows what finding it is so in the small bowel there is continuous involvement there is no continuous involvement there is skip lesion in the small bowel you can see lesions are present inflammatory lesions as skip lesions and there you are seeing a very classical appearance yes very good cob cobblestone appearance cobblestone appearance is a feature of crohn's disease so other features of crohn's disease are crohn's disease will have inflammation involving full thickness full thickness inflammation of the bowel therefore they develop strictures they also develop strictures full thickness biopsy with the formation of strictures with the formation of fistula all are features of crohn's disease so please don't forget this mcq from crohn's so what are the ulcers seen in crohn's in the bowel what is the name of this ulcer yes there are skip lesions strictures fistulas non cascading granula granuloma on biopsy they are all pathology questions you know that very well so non cascading granulomas all are seen in crohn's and what is this finding seen in crohn's yes it is a serpentine ulcer in bowel serpentine also called as like a beer claw we are putting like a line beer claw ulcer is seen in crohn's so beer claw ulcer or serpentine ulcer you are seeing here classical image of crohn's disease so now let us discuss some more ulcers in the bowel what is the name of this ulcer in the bowel it looks longitudinal where will you get longitudinal ulcer in the bowel longitudinal ulcer in small bowel seen in typhoid which will go for perforation on third week so typhoid ulcers will be longitudinal okay and which condition you get ulcers like this they are transverse ulcers transverse ulcers seen in tb transverse ulcers are seen in tb in which condition you get ulcers like this like a collar button like a collar button ulcers like a collar button ulcers are seen in ulcerative colitis in ulcerative colitis you see collar button ulcers pathology biopsy of the bowel biopsy of the bowel shows ulcer like this what is this ulcer on biopsy not gross it is known as flask shape ulcers flask shaped ulcers are seen in amebiasis it is not a gross inspection so gross ulcers are uh, longitudinal ulcers in typhoid transverse ulcers in tb serpentine ulcers or beer claw ulcers in crohn's color button ulcers in ulcerative colitis so don't forget the various ulcers in the bowel so this image very clearly shows you a crohn's disease with the strictures so what is the treatment of strictures in crohn's disease strictures in crohn's disease are the most common cause of in intestinal obstruction in in crohn's disease most common cause of intestinal obstruction is due to strictures and this is the most common indication for surgery in crohn's what should i do you should not resect the strictures you should try to 
do stricture of plastic for example if this is the stricture i should open it horizontally and i should close it vertically like this this is called as hinky mikulic stricture of plastic so don't try to resect the stricture because if i keep on resecting the stricture patients will result in short bubble syndrome so the commonly done procedure is hinky mikulic stricture of plastic so avoid resection as much as possible avoid resections to avoid to prevent what i already told you know short bubble syndrome short bubble syndrome happens because every month the patient will get some problem and we have to keep on resecting okay therefore uh, we have to prevent short bubble syndrome therefore avoid resection because crohn's is incurable disease crohn's is an incurable disease it involves from mouth to anus except mouth to anus every area is involved except rectum only one area not involved in your body is rectum that is why we are always advising them not to resect try to do only uh, only try to do stricture of plastic preserve the bubble as much as possible so now there is a patient coming to me with the complaints of bleeding per rectum i am doing a colonoscopy see colonoscopy shows multiple lesions appearance see this is a continuous involvement of the bubble as you see here i am drawing it i am drawing a continuous involvement of the colon like this so like this i am drawing a continuous involvement so some areas which are not involved we cannot call it as skip lesion because it is continuously involving so the uninvolved areas no they look like polyps called as pseudo polyps so pseudo polyps mimics like cobblestone appearance but the, we cannot diagnose with one image we have to look for the continuation or skip lesions so in pseudo polyps is a finding in a continuous lesion whereas cobblestone is a skip lesions there will be skip lesions present so please don't forget this is pseudo polyps so if at all the cancer will happen that will happen in this area only this is the inflammatory area this is normal area this is inflamed area okay please don't forget this point classical image of intersusception very commonly favorite fmg question every year at least one question comes from intersusception most common cause is hypertrophy peyer's patches most common age is infants most common presentation of these babies what is the common presentation of these children they come to me with a classical finding of red current jelly stools the mother will bring the baby with a red current jelly stools and when i examine the abdomen i will see a sausage shaped mass near the umbilicus so palpation shows sausage shaped mass near the umbilicus and rif is empty right iliac fossa is empty that sign is known as lee dancy sign so the investigation of choice is usually done by ultrasound is enough usually ultrasound is enough so very rarely people go for ct scan and all ultrasound itself is enough which will show me the classical signs like bull's eye sign bull's eye pseudo kidney okay pseudo kidney sign everything is seen on ultrasound itself so here you are seeing an image of a ct scan showing you a polyp inside with the intersusception this is known as target sign target sign is a finding shown here in a ct scan which is also a finding of intersusception and 100 times asked images for your exam barium enema barium enema shows here claw sign claw or pincer sign is seen in intersusception the classical image shown here is claw sign or pincer sign is shown in intersusception there is another one sign in intersusception in barium enema which is known as coiled spring sign so what is the treatment of intersusception in children intersusception in children is treated by enema so we have to in treatment of choice in infants is very easy we have to go for air or saline enema is enough no need of even surgery in infants just use air or saline enema that will reduce the intersusception so treatment of choice in infants is air or saline enema is enough okay so please don't forget coiled spring sign claw sign target sign Uh, bull's eye sign pseudo kidney sign everything is seen in intersection 
in infants it is very easy to manage just i take a 50 ml syringe and through the anus push air or saline the obstructed bubble will come out like this classical finding you can see on ultrasound so now coming to the um, biliary chapter so these are some important questions because uh, in a short session i could not cover everything but whatever i am covering are all being asked in your fmg exam so if you want a detailed discussion of rapid revision there is 16 hours videos available in dog tutorials if some of your friends are having subscription you can get from them and you can see that videos or you can just go through this videos which is very important in the last minute because only from 15 more days left you cannot go for a new source of material now so whatever you prepared just have this as an extra added points whichever you are getting here so what is this question shown here this is a most important mcq what is the anomaly shown in the kellogg's triangle in the biliary system this is a very interesting anomaly so all of you know the boundaries of kellogg's triangle please don't forget the boundaries of kellogg's triangle this is bile duct this is cystic duct this is gall bladder this is liver this is the liver okay this is liver now you should know there was one triangle we used to call once upon a time called as hepatocystic triangle so this red color triangle bounded by liver common hepatic duct gall bladder with cystic duct was once upon a time called as hepatocystic triangle it is hepatocystic triangle so actually what is kellogg's triangle is this is a cystic artery going like this so cystic artery the triangle i am now highlighting is called as kellogg's triangle so what is kellogg's triangle made up of kellogg's triangle is made up of c c c cystic artery cystic duct and common hepatic duct this is actually called as kellogg's triangle and the node is cystic node of lung okay lung node is seen inside another node is muscagny node is other name for it swart says the name of the node is muscagny so this is a classical kellogg's triangle there is an interesting point sometimes into the kellogg's triangle this picture you can see into the kellogg's triangle who is coming inside right hepatic artery is coming inside what is the name of this anomaly right hepatic artery inside kellogg's triangle is called as dash this question is fmc question last year yes what is the name of this caterpillar turn very good location it is called as moini hands hump moini hands hump or caterpillar turn so I repeat mcq for your exam caterpillar turn or moini hands hump please don't forget it is abnormal course of right hepatic artery into the kellogg's triangle it comes into the kellogg's triangle please don't forget this question so you are seeing gall bladder on x ray gall bladder seen on x ray what is it it is very dangerous because it is porcelain gall bladder why i am telling this is dangerous because it is 10% risk of malignancy 10% risk of malignancy is seen in this case so this is very dangerous so porcelain gall bladder is 10% risk of malignancy seen so tell me what is the investigation shown here all these are very simple questions hepatobiliary and speciality they will be asking very basic questions you should not make mistake this is an investigation known as ercp endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography showing you the pancreatic duct bile duct what is the most common complication of this procedure most common complication of this procedure is pancreatitis so pancreatitis is seen in 5% cases so with the ercp i can do some procedures ercp i will do some procedures like sphincterotomy stenting and all so ercp can be used for doing sphincterotomy or stenting in such cases sphincterotomy stenting or when i am going to do some procedures it will cause another complication that is sepsis so when i am going for a sub procedure with the ercp it can go for sepsis when i do ercp for a simple ercp just putting the contrast it can cause pancreatitis okay for procedure with the ercp it may cause sepsis what is this investigation shown here what is investigation shown here this is an investigation showing you mrcp mrcp is nothing but mri it is t2 weighted mri it is t2 weighted mri in which the bile acts as a contrast you can see here bile is acting as a contrast bile acts as a contrast in this image 
so you can see this is a gallbladder pancreatic duct bile duct everything can be seen and this is the investigation of choice for cbd cbd pathology what is the investigation of choice answer is mrcp so whenever there is a problem in the bile duct like a stones or a cancer whatever it is that investigation of choices mrcp and this is a picture showing you mrcp shows what sign you can see mrcp shows a meniscus sign mrcp is showing you meniscus sign means what meniscus sign means there is a stone in the bile duct there is a cbd stone and there is a bile duct stone it will show you a sign known as meniscus sign please don't forget image of meniscus sign Okay, from you can see gallbladder full of stones, and there is a stone which obstructed in the distal bile duct. So this is meniscus sign. So here there are three types of stone shown here. One is cholesterol stone. This is black pigment stone, and this is brown stone. So now basic question: Which is common in hemolytic anemias? Which stone is seen in hemolytic anemias? It is black stone. In hemolytic anemias, the stone seen is black stone which stone is seen in infections it is brown stone which stone is present in the foreign bodies foreign bodies stent in such cases you get a stone brown pigment stone cholesterol stone is the most common stone in western countries not in india in western countries the commonest stone seen is cholesterol stones most common stone in asians is brown stone In Asians include Chinese and India. It is brown stone. Black stone is the most common stone seen in children because it is seen in hemolytic anemias. It is the most common stone in children. Okay, so mixed stone is a stone worldwide most common. Mixed is a stone which contains a mixture of cholesterol and pigment. It is the most common worldwide stone. Worldwide we get mixed type of stone. So brown stone is Asians, mixed stone is worldwide. Black stones is common in children. So please don't forget this. This there is no clear cut answer on which is common type of stone, but pathology you should not forget. What stone is seen in which which condition? So brown pigment stone. I want to tell one interesting finding. So brown pigment stone. Please don't forget. Always gall stones are formed in the gall bladder only. Always the gall stones are formed in the gall bladder. From there only they will jump into the bile duct like this. So this is common phenomenon. So when you get a bile duct stone, usually they are formed in the gallbladder. Then coming to the bile duct, so they are called as secondary bile duct stone. There is only one stone which can form in the bile duct itself. What is that stone? That is primary bile duct stone. Primary bile duct stone is usually brown stone only. It is a brown stone which is formed in the bile duct itself. So please remember which stone is formed in the bile duct itself is brown pigment stone is formed in the bile duct itself. So secondary bile duct stones are formed in the gallbladder and jump into the bile duct. So primary bile duct stone, secondary bile duct stone, which is a primary bile duct stone. Please don't forget it is brown stone. This is a very commonly asked any set question. So please don't forget primary bile duct stone. This is a hundred times asked FMG question. A patient comes to you with the complaints of right hypochondrial pain, right hypochondrial pain. Ultrasound is shown here. Ultrasound abdomen shows what finding here. You are seeing a stone in the gallbladder having a posterior acoustic shadow. Gall stone showing posterior acoustic shadow. So that's a classical gall stone posterior acoustic shadow. So, ultrasound abdomen is ninety percent sensitive for gall stones. Ninety percent, whereas CT abdomen is only seventy to eighty percent sensitive. So, therefore, you should not forget ultrasound is better than CT scan for gall stone. Very interesting point. CT scan is not accurate for gall stone. Ultrasound is more accurate for gall stone. So, investigation of choice for gall stones is what? Not CT scan. It is ultrasound only. Okay, ultrasound is investigation of choice for gall stone. CT is less sensitive for gall stones. If you suspect polyps, if you suspect polyps versus gall stones, which is which will I do? I have a doubt whether it is a polyp or a gall stone. I will usually go for an MRCP. MRCP is best to differentiate whether it is a gall stone or a polyp. 
if there is a stone like appearance i am thinking it may be a polyp also that case i'll go for a mrcp okay so please don't forget what is the investigation to differentiate polyp versus gall stones in the gall bladder so this is a repeat question when you have a patient with a bile duct stone when a patient is having a bile duct stone what is the first done investigation when a patient comes to you with a suspected bile duct stone so plus probably patient would have come with what jaundice pain jaundice and fever a patient comes to you with a pain jaundice fever called as charcot stride patient is coming to you with a charcot stride pain jaundice fever so pain jaundice fever a patient has come to me first done is not mrcp first done is ultrasound ultrasound will give me some clue sometimes it will show the stone it will show bile ducts dilated such cases i should go for investigation of choice ultrasound shows cbd stones investigation of choice for cbd stone if they ask answer is mrcp so after doing mrcp if it shows stone in the bile duct what is the gold standard treatment for this stone gold standard treatment of choice for cbd stone what is answer i should go for ercp plus sphincterotomy and stone removal i should open the sphincter go inside remove the stone and come out and keep a stent like this inside so i'll keep a double pig tail stent double pig tail stent will be kept inside so i will remove the stone and i will keep a double pig tail stent inside so this is ercp sphincterotomy plus stenting so therefore the order of management please don't forget see they, they are not going to ask you so you all know very well fmg questions have been already asked in a more clinical oriented they are not going to ask you what is the investigation of choice what is this finding they are not going to ask you one liner question they are going to ask you only clinical scenario questions where you have to understand the concepts so without understanding the concept by just knowing this is tarkat said pain on this fever this is like that, that if you keep on preparing like that will be difficult so you should concentrate more on concepts so please try to understand a disease patient coming to you how to manage them what to be done first what is to be done next like that if you remember only you can answer many questions nowadays so first done investigation is ultrasound investigation of choice is mrcp following an mrcp i will send the patient for ercp if ercp is failed i will go for this what is this if ercp is failed i will go for an open treatment i will open the bile duct like this vertically i will open the bile duct and remove the stones out and after removing the stones out i will keep a stent like this inside the bile duct after removing the stone i will keep a stent inside this is known as t tube stenting okay this is known as cholelidocotomy cholelidocotomy means removing opening the bile duct and removing the stent stone so t tube is kept in these patients so please don't forget this question can be highly expected question after keeping a t tube on an eighth post op day i will do a t tube cholangiogram i will do a t tube cholangiogram as shown in the image so on a t tube cholangiogram what finding you are seeing here i am seeing a missed stone you can see this picture showing you missed stone so t tube cholangiogram shows missed stone so missed stone or retained stone is the name given for a uh, stones which are seen within 2 years after gallbladder surgery so t tube cholangiogram shows stones in the bile duct not a worm it is not worm i have done a surgery and i have missed to remove the stone during surgery so this is classical missed stone or retained stone and this stone will be removed by one technique from bailey known as burkin technique very good very good priya that is correct burkin technique is a technique of removal of the stone via the t tube tract via t tube tract after 6 weeks i will remove the stone missed stone will be removed via the t tube tract called as burkin technique so burkin technique is a highly expected question it is there still in 28th edition bailey so please don't forget burkin technique is a technique of removal of missed stone missed stone in the bile duct so bile duct the gallbladder related chapter they will definitely ask you so many questions from the stones please don't forget that so this is the last year question what is the diagnosis from the image shown here it is annular pancreas what is the anomaly what embryological reason for this annular pancreas so you should not forget this embryology it's an embryology question actually 
this is the dorsal bud of pancreas okay this is dorsal bud of pancreas and this is ventral bud of pancreas so what is annular pancreas failure of rotation of ventral bud like this so failure of rotation of ventral bud failure of rotation of ventral bud that is mcq when failure of they will ask you annular pancreas is due to failure of fusion failure of rotation of dorsal bud failure of rotation of so you should not get confused it is a failure of rotation of ventral bud results in hugging of the duodenum by the entire pancreas results in a clinical feature gastric outlet obstruction these babies will come to you with the vomiting of bilious gastric outlet obstruction happens and treatment of choice for these cases is duodeno we don't go and remove it we just do a bypass duodeno jejunostomy we will anastomose the proximal duodenum with the jejunum so duodeno jejunostomy will be done for these children so duodeno jejunostomy is a treatment of choice for these babies so please don't forget what is the treatment of choice for annular pancreas it is duodeno jejunostomy so very commonly asked question is in acute pancreatitis they will ask you so many signs in pancreas chapter it's a very important chapter because it's one of the important emergencies we see in practice in acute pancreatitis they will ask you what is mohammed prayer sign what is mohammed prayer sign it is a patient sitting with the leaning forward position patient is having severe pain and therefore they are leaning forward so that is known as mohammed prayer sign like this so they will be leaning forward like this known as mohammed prayer sign so it is a case of acute pancreatitis acute pancreatitis clinical examination shows patient leaning forward so that is known as mohammed prayer sign and you are seeing some more signs in this picture this is a sign known as cullen sign this is a sign known as gray turner sign gray turner sign cullen sign are the various signs and another sign in the inguinal region is called as fox sign and when i take x ray i will get another sign known as x ray shows colon cut off sign so so umbilicus cullen okay u for umbilicus turner on the lumbar region fox is inguinal ecchymosis and colon cut off sign shown in the colon okay it is due to pancreatitis there will be colon cut off sign yes some of you wanted to know about bile duct injury protocol after cholecystectomy a patient has gone for bile duct injury during surgery so bile duct injury what symptom the patient will have post operatively following yesterday it is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy today the patient will have what finding yes very good gasless abdomen gasless abdomen colon cut off sign gasless abdomen very important that is also another finding sentinel loop sign on x ray these are all radiology questions sentinel loop sign all these are seen on acute pancreatitis so bile duct injury patients will come to you with the complaints of pain right hypochondrium patients will complain of pain right hypochondrial pain so now so immediately what should i do next next i should do an ultrasound ultrasound shows a collection in the abdomen what should i do an ultrasound is done that is showing a collection in the right hypochondrial region like this what should i do next i should go for a percutaneous drainage so under ultrasound guidance immediately put a percutaneous drainage so wait for two weeks two weeks later i should go for investigation of choice for bile duct injury that is ercp ercp is an investigation of choice for bile duct injury which shows a classification known as strasberg classification of bile duct injuries so strasberg classification is a very favorite question for a neat pg exam so though it is not being asked in fmg please remember strasberg injury type a is a leak from the cystic duct that is type a is cystic duct leak so type b is type b and c are same type b and c are same this is aberrant duct in type b and c there is aberrant right side posterior duct these people are having right side posterior duct in injury b i have put a clip i have clipped that in, duct in b and in c i have cut the duct resulting in by leaking out so c is having cut b is having clip so which is having leak 
C is having leak, B is having no leak. What is D? In a D injury, I have injured the bile duct laterally, laterally injured bile duct, leaking the bile out. That is lateral injury is D. E is the bile duct is cut circumferentially like this. So that is circumferential injury is E. So don't forget there is circumferential injury is E. So Strasbourg classification will be definitely asked in the exam. They may ask you this image. They can give you this image and they will ask you what is this classification. Strasbourg classification of bile duct injuries. Type A is cystic duct leak. B is clip. C is cut. D is lateral injury. E is circumferential injury as shown in the image. So this, these patients will go for strictures. And once they develop stricture, there is another classification known as bismuth classification of MRCP. So once they develop a stricture, we have to go for a reconstruction procedure afterwards. So the stricture will be reconstructed after a long time. So after some usually done at 8 to 12 weeks, we will go for a reconstruction of the stricture. So this is a very simple protocol, but it is very important question for a neat PG and the initial exams. It will be discussed for more than half an hour on Strasbourg classification and bile duct injury. But please remember, for FMG exam, if a patient comes to you with a suspected bile duct injury, what will you do next is ultrasound. That is a commonly asked question. And if there is a collection, what will I do next? I will put a percutaneous drainage. So investigation of choices, ERCP, and questions beyond this will be for need PG level and for initial level. Okay. So this is an image showing you the classical finding I told you, you know, colon cut-up sign. It is colon cut-up sign shown in the image from X-ray. So what is this finding? A patient who had bismuth classification of MRCP is nothing but the extension of Strasbourg. So we have to go for E1, E2 like that. E1 is stricture more than 2 centimeter from the hilum. E2 is less than 2 centimeter from the hilum. E3 is at hilum. E4 is separated ducts. Separated ducts. E5 is aberrant duct injury. So E1, E2, E3, E4, E5 are other subdivisions of Strasbourg which are called as bismuth. So stricture at more than 2 centimeter from hilum. Less than 2 centimeter from hilum. At hilum. Separated ducts right and left. E5 is aberrant duct stricture. Like that it goes on. So it's a, a very important topic for INI set. They, I don't think they will ask you each small subdivisions in your exams. So this is a classical image showing you pseudocyst. Pseudocyst. Pseudocyst is shown in the image. It is most commonly seen in the lesser sac. Lesser sac means behind the stomach. Originating at the level of body and tail of pancreas. At the level of body and tail of pancreas, you are seeing a uh, cyst. So it can be seen in head, the body, tail, anywhere it can see in your abdomen. It is seen anywhere in the abdomen. What is the treatment of choice for this? Investigation of choice is shown in the image that is CT scan. Treatment of choice is cysto gastrostomy. It will be just a simple image question. They will simply ask you what is the image shown here for a patient who had a pancreatitis, it is pseudocyst. Okay. So don't forget pseudocyst finding, pseudocyst image. And coming to very important topic, pancreatic tumors. So pancreatic tumors. So I'm going to tell you there are two types of tumors I want you to remember for your exam. So it is three types, two types will be asked for your exam. The most common type of tumor in pancreas is adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is the most common tumor in pancreas. Can you tell me where is it common? It is most common in head of pancreas. So most common site of pancreatic tumor is in this place, head of pancreas. Second common site of pancreatic tumor is, what is this part? It is called as ampulla. Within the ampullary area, it is called as periampullary cancers. And the least common, third common or least common is body and tail of pancreas. So there are three places you get pancreatic cancer. Most commonly you get in head of pancreas, second common in periampere region, third in body and tail. So the other important tumor is neuroendocrine tumors of pancreas, in which the most common is insulinoma. Insulinoma is most common. It is equal in head, body, tail. Okay. 
commonest tumor is insulinoma which is common in head body tail second common tumor is gastrinoma which is common in passaro triangle passaro triangle is a place of gastrinoma so the second common tumor is passaro triangle passaro triangle is formed by junction of second and third part duodenum neck of pancreas another anatomy is not shown here that is cystic duct cbd junction so this is a classical passaro triangle cystic duct cbd junction neck of pancreas second part of duodenum so this is a triangle known as passaro triangle in which gastrinoma is common so gastrinoma is common in passaro triangle insulinoma is equal in head body tail so insulinoma they have more insulin production so they come to you with a whipple striat whipple striat is because of the insulin secretion causing hypoglycemia patient has hypoglycemia sugar level less than 40 and symptoms relieved by sugar so sugar level less than 40 relieved by sugar and hypoglycemia are the features of insulinoma gastrinoma patient comes to you with the zollinger ellison syndrome the clinical feature of gastrinoma is zollinger ellison syndrome so please don't forget uh, no no not at pringle pringle manner is not associated with passaro triangle pringle is different so pringles is at the level of uh, posteriorly at the level of lesser uh, at the level of epiploic foramen it is not related to it so insulinoma is head equal to body equal to tail gastrinoma is seen in passaro triangle so this is a last year question for your exam so what is the surgery shown here surgery shown here is whipple's operation so they are i am telling you not they are started asking images of many surgical pictures so this is a surgical illustrated images they are still asking now so this is a whipple's operation usually done for following cancers i am drawing which all cancer we do head of pancreas cancer head of pancreas peri ampullary cancer duodenal second part cancer okay distal bile duct cancer and for gastrinomas so what are the tumors i will do this whipple's operation please understand gastrinomas distal bile duct cancer d2 cancer peri ampullary cancer head of pancreas cancer i am going to cut the stomach at this level i am going to cut the pancreas at this level and i remove the small bowel so this operation is nothing but pancreatico duodenectomy operation pancreatico duodenectomy is the original name it is done it is called as whipples so pancreatico duodenectomy so after removing all this including bile duct and gallbladder i have to do three cut three anastomoses one is gj you can see gastro jejunostomy two is pancreatico jejunostomy three is hepatico jejunostomy or bile duct to jejunum so this is classical picture showing you reconstruction after whipples so reconstruction after whipples is shown here now the most common question is most common cause of death in whipples is what that is due to one of the important anastomoses which anastomoses do you think is very important pancreatic jejunostomy colidaco jejunostomy gastro jejunostomy which is the most important anastomoses or otherwise achilles heel of this operation achilles heel of this operation is pancreatic jejunostomy pancreatic jejunostomy is an achilles heel so leak of this patients will die pancreatic jejunostomy leak is a common cause of death in whipples so please don't forget what is a common cause of death in whipples operation is pancreatic jejunal anastomotic leak anastomotic leak of pancreatic jejunostomy is the common cause of death in whipples operation and this question all of you know the common uh, segments in liver so segmental anatomy of liver this is a line drawn to divide the liver into right and left what is it it is cantel's line which runs from ivc to gallbladder fossa so a line running from ivc to gallbladder fossa is known as cantel's line and based on this line i have right liver and left liver right liver is 2 and 3 segments 4a 4b segment the left liver is 5 6 7 8 my simple question what are the segments removed in right epitectomy in right epitectomy segments removed are 5 6 7 8 in left epitectomy segments removed are 
segments 2 3 4 a 4 b now simple another question what is mean by right trisectionectomy trisectionectomy of right side means i will remove 5 6 7 8 plus 4a plus 4b will also be added right trisectionectomy means i will add 4a 4b now left trisectionectomy means i will add left trisectionectomy means 2 3 4a 4b plus 5 and 8 will be added that is left trisectionectomy so this segmental anatomy may be asked in your exams as an image based question they may ask what is this segment number like that so they will ask you what is the segment shown in this arrow mark so what is the segment segment 5 will be like that they will be asking you questions from the segments please don't forget images of liver segment and some of you mentioned as pringles manual that is shown here this is another important image for fmj exam it is applied anatomy question so pringles manual is a manual in which i am entering my finger into the epibloic foramen so epibloic foramen also known as foramen of winslow into the epibloic foramen i put the finger and i will put a clamping at this inflow so when i'm putting a clamp i will arrest the bleeding from which vessels arrest the bleeding in the liver from which vessels in a trauma surge in a trauma or in any surgery i will do this i will arrest the bleeding in the liver from portal vein branches and from hepatic artery branches this manure will not stop bleeding from where which from which one this manure will not stop bleeding from not stops bleeding from hepatic vein that is mcq please don't forget pringle manure will stop very good so very good all of you are correct so it will stop the bleeding from portal vein and hepatic artery but not from hepatic vein that is a classical mcq please don't forget so what is the picture shown here it is a picture showing you modified sengstecan blackmore tube what is the use of this tube modified sengstecan blackmore tube so modified sengstecan blackmore tube image is shown here which is also called as minnesota tube what is the use of this tube this tube is used for arresting variceal bleed arrests variceal bleeding so bleeding esophageal varices are arrested by means of this it is not helpful for not useful in mallory v star please don't forget it is not useful in mallory v's or any other bleeding it can only arrest venous bleed uh, this variceal bleed and this is gastric balloon and this is esophageal balloon and it has four channel it has four channel like this so please don't forget modified things taken black motive is used for arresting variceal bleed and this is an illustrated image of one another procedure known as transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt so transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting is nothing but tipss so it is also done for failed endotherapy failed endoscopic banding so failed endoscopic banding in varices we will go for the next step as tips so tips will be done what is the most common complication of tips most common complication of tips i am going to bypass the blood from the hepatic portal vein into the hepatic vein directly without metabolism in the liver therefore most common complication is encephalopathy okay encephalopathy is the very good very good sagitya that's correct encephalopathy is the most common complication immediate complication when i am doing the procedure the radiologist will call us what is the most common immediate complication when the procedure is going on it will happen capsule rupture they will rupture the capsule and cause bleeding they rupture when they are going to enter the liver they rupture the capsule and will cause severe bleeding capsule rupture and bleeding is the immediate complication during the procedure is of tips is this so now some important questions from the abscess what is the most common cause of abscess pyogenic abscess most common cause of pyogenic abscess is E. coli followed by Klebsiella. So, most common route of infection entering the liver is via the 
biliary route the infection enters the uh, liver via the biliary route it enters the liver and it causes multiple macro abscess it forms multiple macro abscess so these patients will come to you with the fever plus chills and they may have increased lft liver function test is altered and we have to immediately do uh, investigation of choice which is cect abdomen and after doing a cect abdomen that will show me clustered abscess clustered abscess not a well defined abscess and i have to go for treatment of choice aspirate abscess so aspiration is very important in a pyogenic abscess but usually they will not ask questions from pyogenic abscess they will ask you more questions from amoebic abscess for your exam so pyogenic abscess is very common in immunocompromised patients please don't forget immunocompromised patients will develop pyogenic abscess whereas an a patient who are severe alcoholic will develop amoebic abscess caused by entamoeba histolytica since it is a very common case in indian practice they will ask you more questions from amoebic abscess and amoebic abscess patients will come to you with a clinical feature of abdominal pain fever is very low low grade fever not so high grade fever like pyogenic abscess so low grade fever is only seen and treatment of choice is very easy we can only treat them with injection metronidazole no need of aspiration so as you are seeing in this image it is not always done so it is not always mandatory to do aspiration so the question is in amoebic abscess when will you aspirate amoebic abscess metrogel is enough as a treatment of choice in pyogenic abscess i told you we have to aspirate but amoebic abscess what is the indication of aspiration this is a very commonly asked initial question when the size of the abscess more than 5 cm when it is superficially located abscess when the abscess is located very superficially superficially located abscess number 2 and when the abscess is on the left lobe and when you have a doubtful diagnosis you are having a diagnosis whether it is an abscess or something else so whether it is an amoebic abscess or something um, uh, doubtful diagnosis when there is a doubtful diagnosis number 5 fa failure to respond so when I, when will i do abscess aspiration more than 5 cm superficial loco located left lobe abscess uh, uh, left lobe abscess because it is very superficial and it can rupture so it rupture is easy in a left lobe abscess but usually amoebic abscess most commonly seen in right side posterior lobe that is nothing but segment 6 and 7 commonly seen in segment 6 and 7 that is very common amoebic abscess is most common in segment 6 and 7 okay so the most common complication is rupture that is why we are going to aspirate in a bigger abscess it ruptures into peritoneal cavity rupture into peritoneum okay rupture into peritoneum so this is a picture showing you a ruptured amoebic abscess into the peritoneal cavity we are operating by a laparoscopy so what is the uh, what what is the common tumor markers in various tumors so tumor markers are very important for your exams i am going to tell you various tumor markers right from head to foot where is calcitonin used as a tumor marker i am telling the tumor marker you tell me the tumor where is it i am asking the question in reverse order calcitonin is a tumor marker in medullary cancer medullary cancer thyroid thyroglobulin is a tumor marker in thyroglobulin is a tumor marker in papillary thyroid cancer and follicular thyroid both the cancers papillary thyroid cancer and follicular thyroid cancer it is thyroglobulin can you tell me where is the tumor marker chromogranin a used chromogranin a is a tumor marker of dash yes arsenide tumor arsenide tumors in the git chromogranin a is a tumor marker of arsenide tumor where is the tumor marker c kit is used c kit also called as cd117 cd34 and dog1 all these are tumor markers used in gastrointestinal stromal tumors they are used in gist very good that is used in gist c kit cd117 cd34 is used in gist CEA is a tumor marker in which all tumors? CEA is a tumor marker in colorectal cancers, 
gall bladder cancers it is a tumor marker ca is a tumor marker in colorectal cancers and gall bladder cancers ca199 is a tumor marker in pancreas cancer and bile duct cancer pancreas cancer and bile duct cancer it is ca199 don't forget it ca199 so why i am discussing tumor markers in this chapter because at cc what is a tumor marker old tumor marker what is a new tumor marker for hcc old tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein new tumor marker is puca protein induced vitamin k absence protein induced vitamin k absence so it is a new tumor marker protein induced vitamin k absence is a new tumor marker and another type of hcc known as fibrolamellar type of hcc what is a tumor marker fibrolamellar type of hcc the tumor marker is neurotensin b so many tumor markers are there please go through the tumor markers prostate cancer what is a tumor marker latest tumor marker is psa prostate specific antibody okay psa so psa is a tumor marker of prostate cancer so please go through the important tumor markers they will be not asked as a single solo question they will be asked as a combination in various questions okay so what is the most common site of ectopic spleen you can see a picture showing you most common site of ectopic spleen here so most common site of ectopic spleen is splenic hilum most common site of ectopic stomach where is it seen ectopic gastric mucosa it is commonly seen most common site of ectopic stomach is meckels so most common site of ectopic sebaceous tissue where is it seen sebaceous tissue in the lips called as fordyce's disease sebaceous tissue is commonly seen in the lips uh, known as fordyce's disease most common site of ectopic salivary tissue it is seen in angle of mandible known as staphney bone cyst it is seen in the angle of mandible known as staphney bone cyst so most common site of ectopic thyroid where is it seen thyroid so they are seen in the lingual region lingual thyroid most common site of ectopic parathyroid see these are all type of questions will not come for you here after these are all just to attract the crowd nothing this and all will not be used what is needed is understanding the concepts and reading this type of most common most first important that and all type of questions are old pattern fmg question that type of questions you will not get ectopic parathyroid is commonly seen in the media stenum so like that most common what is the name named signs named nodes named triads these type of questions i have not seen for the past 4 years in fmg exam so i don't think they will be asking any such type of uh, questions for your exam i feel that is my opinion but i let us see because uh, every year uh, every year the i see many faculties are taking like that one line questions images interesting points but that, that and all is not asked now the questions are more applied they are asking giving a clinical scenario they are asking what to be done what is the method of treating this case like that the questions are more into uh, clinical aspects only okay so now let us go to this uh, so for more detailed videos you can follow my instagram page or facebook telegram everywhere it is surgery sixer and you can follow my youtube channel many detailed videos are there if you have time i don't think those are fmg students you have no time but others uh, fmg final year students you all can go through those videos so let us see some important uh, specialty questions so they are so the number of questions will be less the only area they will give more importance is urology so i have given some points from urology identify this picture this is a picture showing you stagon calculi stagon calculi is nothing but triple phosphate stone triple phosphate stone has five mcqs number 1 it is the most common stone in infection what infection infection due to proteus very good number 2 it is a it is a smooth stone it is not a hard it is not so hard it is a smooth and smooth smooth walled stone so it will not cause hematuria commonly so hematuria is common with calcium oxalate stone it is a smooth walled stone number 3 this is the stone which is taking the shape of the calyces that is why it is called as 
stagon stone it is the most common stone in infection it is a smooth walled stone all the stones are formed in acid urine the only stone formed in alkaline urine so the only stone formed in alkaline urine is this so the, all the stones are formed in acid urine which is the stone formed in alkaline urine is this stone this is the only stone formed in alkaline urine and what is the type of crystal seen on urinary examination so you should not forget this is the appearance on urinary crystals how does it look like it looks like a coffin lid coffin lid crystals and this type of stones are treatment of choices by means of pcnl percutaneous nephrolithotomy is the treatment of this we have to go by a minimally invasive method go inside and take out the stones that's please don't forget stagon stone showing coffin lid crystals so what are the other urinary crystals where will i get crystals in the form of hexagonal crystals like this seen in cysteine stones cysteine stones will have hexagonal crystals where will i get envelope shaped crystals like this envelope shaped or bipyramidal envelope or bipyramidal crystals seen in calcium oxalate stones they are calcium oxalate stones are envelope or bipyramidal crystals where will i get dumbbell shaped calcium oxalate monohydrate calcium oxalate monohydrate will have dumbbell shaped crystals so where is crystals images will be asked in pathology so please go through that and this is an ivp showing you i am going to show you some ivp appearances this is an ivp showing you spider leg appearance where will you get spider leg appearance in a urology spider leg appearance on ivp is a classical finding of polycystic kidney disease so polycystic kidney disease patients will come to you with the complaints of hypertension and they will go for renal failure so renal failure by around 50 to 60 years all of them will go for renal failure and treatment of choice for this patients is what renal transplant we have to go for a renal transplant in case of polycystic kidney disease so name the ivp appearance shown in this image it is an image showing you horseshoe kidney horseshoe kidney shows flower vase appearance a classical image of flower vase the image is looking like a flower vase appearance this is a horseshoe kidney so horseshoe kidney the fusion is found the two kidney are fused at the level of l4 vertebra so the level of l4 vertebra they are fused so nothing to worry there is no complication with horseshoe kidney no need of going and resecting the isthmus so isthmus is at the level of l4 no need to resect it so the only surgery where i may need to separate this in an abdominal aortic aneurysm operation abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery i need to resect this okay i may need to resect this isthmus in only one surgery that is at the level of abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery i need to resect this isthmus otherwise no need of touching the isthmus it will not cause any symptom at all yes some people call it as handshake appearance handshake or flower with appearance is a finding in horseshoe kidney the fusion is at the level of l4 so please don't forget the fusion is at the level of l4 most important point for your exams so don't forget this point so now name the ivp appearance shown in this picture it is a picture showing you urethroceal with a cobra head appearance urethroceal showing cobra head appearance classical image of urethroceal showing cobra head appearance is shown here so this again i repeat mcq cobra head or adder head appearance so this is a procedure going on known as transurethral resection of prostate so for a bph a procedure shown here is transurethral resection of prostate and this is the most prominent part when i am doing transurethral resection of prostate distal limit of transection distal limit is at this point is at what is this point known as anybody so when i am doing transurethral resection of prostate i should keep on coring the uh, prostate i should stop at one place i should not come beyond that place what is it this is a repeat mcq verumen tenum so verumen tenum in a turp please remember in a bph surgery benign prostate hypertrophy so this is a very classical question this is a prostate this is prostate so this is a 
prostate showing you enlargement causing compression of the urethra so what we will do is we will put a cystoscope and we start resecting the tissue like this so during this torp there are so many mcqs when i am doing this resection what is the fluid i should i should use fluid of choice so fluid of choice during this resection is yes what is the fluid of choice it is isotonic glycine isotonic glycine is a fluid of choice very good very good vikram that is correct very mantenam some of you are answering it correctly so fluid of choice is isotonic glycine but the problem is it is very costly so in many government hospitals we use another fluid distilled water distilled water is commonly used in practice what should not be used is normal saline so don't use normal saline during torp we will only use distilled water so i complete the procedure when i am doing the resection i should stop at the level of verum and tenum because if i go beyond the verum and tenum i may injure the external urethral sphincter if i injure the external urethral sphincter patient will go for incontinency therefore i should stop at the level of verum and tenum don't go beyond the verum and tenum so this is very important concept during surgery so when i am doing resection when i am doing resection please don't forget when i am doing continuous resection i should stop at verum and tenum and post operatively the patients since i have used water they can go for dilutional hyponatremia so they will go for dilutional hyponatremia that they will have complaints of confused status in the ward so confused status is there this is a post operative complication following a torp using distilled water that is why they are advising us to use isotonic glycine okay so from this picture what is your diagnosis what is your diagnosis from this picture it is showing you hypospadias what is hypospadias hypospadias is a condition in which the penis is curved like this downwards because of a cord like structure on the under surface known as ventral cordy where is the urethral opening urethra is also opening ventrally the urethral opening is seen ventrally so ventral urethra so ventral cordy ventral urethra and this is dorsal hood so what is the important mcq in this this is a picture of hypospadias what surgery should not be done for them i should not do what surgery for them this is a picture of hypospadias the surgery contraindicated is circumcision is contraindicated in this children because circumcision if i do i cannot reconstruct the urethra so i have to use this foreskin to reconstruct urethra like this in future surgery so what surgery what what, what should not be done is we should not use circumcision in a case of hypospadias babies so what is this this is it's a painless erect penis you can see painless erect penis which is seen on x ray like a calcified penis the penis is looking like a calcified penis what is this it is known as yes peyronie's disease it is a fibrosing disease of the penis called as peyronie's disease the treatment is nesbit operation nesbit or 16 dot technique two operations are there 16 dot operation or nesbit operation should be done for this patients okay so hypospadias is a congenital anomaly there is no specific reason for that okay there is not a uh, there is no specific reason it is a congenital problem okay in the newborn babies so nesbit or 16 dot technique is used for peyronie's disease so what is this case a, a patient comes to you with a bag of worms sensation so bag of worms appearance in the in the testis is nothing in the scrotum is called as varicocel testis varicocele is most common on left side so treatment of choice for varicocele is paloma operation see I, I, in neurology so many named operations will be there please remember the named operations paloma operation is ligation of testicular veins ligation of testicular veins is called as paloma operation okay, please don't forget bag of form sensation ligation of testicular veins so this is a picture showing you torsion testis so torsion testis the most important point you should not forget is the most common anomaly of torsion testis is this what is this anomaly it is known as bell clapper deformity 
so bell clapper deformity is the most common anomaly so in which the testis is lying horizontally because of the long mesoarchium so long mesoarchium so this patients always should be explored bilaterally bilateral exploration should be done always so bilateral exploration done always in these patients we have to explore bilaterally in these cases because opposite side also will have the same anomaly i should do archidopexy so the gangrenous testis will be remove it and do the archidopexy of the opposite side so bilateral thing is done and also there will be always questions from undescended testis please don't forget undescended test these are testis penis these topics are very basic uh, undergraduate questions so please go through them undescended testis is a condition in which there is an arrest in the testis along the inguinal region so most commonly it is found in the inguinal canal it is arrest in the normal pathway to the scrotum there is another test is known as deviation from abnormal pathway so like this is called as other tails like other tails take up the problem so most common site of undescended testis is inguinal canal most common site of ectopic testis ectopic testis is due to the other tails like pubic tail penile tail sorry perineal tail inguinal tail femoral tail all these tails will take up the dominance most common ectopic testis is superficial inguinal pouch along the inguinal tail okay inguinal tail undescended testis is because of gubernaculum tail the gubernaculum tail gubernaculum tail of scrotal tail the scrotal tail gets arrested on the root so there are five tails scrotal tail got disrupted is undescended testis taking deviation into abnormal root is ectopic testis the common site of ectopic testis is inguinal testis most common site of undescended testis is inguinal canal it is superficial inguinal pouch is not in the canal it is outside the canal like this okay ectopic testis is outside the canal so prens sign is uh, is for und for differentiating torsion from arcades it is not related to undescended testis so prens sign is when you lift that testis pain increased in torsion in arcades pain decreased in arcades that is prens sign that's a basic question so prens sign when you lift the testis pain decreases in arcades increases in torsion so name the catheter shown here it is again a, a, a neat pg question it is a catheter shown here known as fogarty balloon catheter fogarty balloon catheter for embolus removal embolectomy arteries having embolus we use this catheter to remove the embolus that is embolectomy catheter okay embolectomy catheter so please don't forget embolectomy catheter so name this anomaly this is anomaly it is a complication of varicose veins what is the anomaly shown here varicose vein showing you a classical anomaly known as yes this is champagne bottle leg patient has lipodermatosclerosis because of lipodermatosclerosis the lower limb goes for a champagne bottle leg that is known as champagne bottle leg anomaly seen in varicose veins it's a complication of varicose vein and you can see usually varicose ulcers are commonly seen where varicose ulcers are most commonly seen over the medial malleolus so varicose veins are most commonly seen on the medial malleolus uh, please don't forget yes cap classification is a favorite question of uh, cap classification of varicose veins is a favorite question for neat pg so c1 is telangiectasia less than 1 mm vein reticular veins which is 1 to 3 mm veins c2 is varicose veins c3 is edema c3 is more than 3 mm is 3 mm is varicose vein c3 is edema c4a is many skin changes skin pigmentations will come in c4a that is nothing but eczema b is lipodermatosclerosis and atrophy blanchy c is a new update in bailey corona flabactetica 
Corona flabactatica is a new update. C5 is healed ulcer. Healed ulcer. C6 is active ulcer. So as you are seeing here, it is an active, active ulcer. It is C6. The major problem with this ulcer is it can go for Marjolin's ulcer. You can see the picture showing you Marjolin's ulcer, which is nothing but a squamous cell cancer from the venous ulcer. Squamous cell cancer from the venous ulcer is called as Marjolin's ulcer. So varicose veins questions will be very basic questions. So they may ask you questions from varicose veins. And this is a picture showing you Mickey Mouse sign. So Mickey Mouse sign showing you shown you here is this is the face of the Mickey Mouse showing you femoral vein laterally femoral artery medially medially is long saphenous vein. So when I'm using a color mode, I can see whether there is any flow or reflex, like everything can be detected from this uh, Mickey Mouse sign. So Mickey Mouse sign is shown in this image. So it's an image based question. What is this graft shown here? It is a Thiersch graft also called as partial thickness graft. So it is done with the help of this knife known as Humby's knife. So the picture shows you partial thickness graft done with the help of Humby's knife. You have to use an Humby's knife to take the partial thickness graft and donor area, no need to do anything, worry. Donor area, new skin grows. So where is it usually taken, taken from? Donor area is what? Donor area of partial thickness graft is thighs. They are usually taken from the thighs using an Humby's knife. Okay. So full thickness graft shown here is called as wolf graft. Wolfy graft is known as full thickness graft. The major advantage of full thickness graft is it is cosmetically beautiful looking. Cosmetically good looking. And it is usually taken from behind the ear. It is taken from the neck, neck, neck or from behind the ear. But the problem is donor area we need to close. Donor area needs closure. Donor area needs closure. It will not grow new skin like partial thickness graft. I have to go and do a reconstruction of the donor area. So that is always a question when a patient comes to you with a finger cut. How will you uh, send the patient now? So this is the patient comes to you with a finger cut. So wash in a tap water, number one. Wrap in a sterile gas, number two. Keep it in a plastic bag, number three. Keep that plastic bag in the ice bag. So number four steps, the steps in sending the patient, sending the patient with the cut finger, wash it in a tap water, wrap in a sterile gauze, keep it in a plastic paper, keep that plastic paper in ice bag and send the patient within six hours to plastic surgeon. So plastic surgeon will do the reconstruction in the order of B fans. The name order is B fans. So bone, extends or tendon, order of reconstruction. It's the Ames question. Order of reconstruction, extends or tendon, flux or tendon, artery or vein. It depends upon the various situations. Nerve, skin. So the first done is bone, last done is skin. So B fans is a mnemonic for you. So <laughs> B fans, thank you, thank you, Malista. So B fans is a mnemonic for Reimplantation of digits. So reimplantation of digits is done in the order of B fans. So what is the finding seen in a baby? Newborn baby is a history. Newborn baby having breathlessness. You are putting a Ryle's tube. Ryle's tube enters chest. Ryle's tube enters chest. And you are giving bag and mask ventilation. Baby becomes more sick. So bag and mask ventilation is contraindicated in this case. You should not do. If I do bag and mask ventilation, the baby will become sick. So what should I do? Therefore, I should intubate the baby. This is a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The hernia shown here is Bogdalak hernia. So Bogdalak hernia is a defect in the posterior, left side posterior hernia is called as Bogdalak. The most common organ which will enter is stomach. The most common organ which will go inside is stomach and when you put bag and mask ventilation, more air will enter the stomach and the baby will go for more breathlessness. So Bogdala cania is most common. There is one another rare cania known as Margagni cania which is common on 
right anterior defect right anteriorly there is a defect known as larry space through that you get a margagni hernia it is very rare hernia so don't worry about it but bogdalak is very common left side margagni is common on right side anterior so there are two important questions very commonly asked the first one is gastroschisis in which there is no covering membrane this is amphalo seal with a covering membrane so which is very dangerous gastroschisis is very dangerous anomaly so the babies will have associated atresia of the bowel associated intestinal atresia will be present in gastroschisis so therefore there is high mortality seen in gastroschisis because of the associated bowel atresia many babies will die okay so what is the most common brain tumor in children and in adults so overall most common brain tumor in adults is mets metastasis from various other places like breast in females lungs in males so most common tumor in adults is most commonly mets breast in female produces mets in males it is lung if they ask you what is the most common primary brain tumor that is a very common mcq primary brain tumor is gbm tbm also called as grade 4 astrocytoma grade 4 astrocytoma called as glioblastoma multiforme it is called as glioblastoma multiforme so in children it is grade 1 astrocytoma that is called as pilocytic astrocytoma pilocytic astrocytoma is the most common tumor in children most common brain tumor in children is pilocytic astrocytoma in adults it is glioblastoma multiforme glioblastoma multiforme is also called as butterfly tumor because it invades from one brain to another brain it's also called as butterfly tumor okay so what is this tumor which is seen calcified on ct scan it is meningioma so meningioma is a tumor which can be seen calcified biopsy shows somoma bodies it is a second common brain tumor okay second most common tumor it is excellent prognosis excellent prognosis seen with meningioma okay so what is the skin cancer shown in this picture the skin cancer in the face along the tear flow area is known as basal cell cancer biopsy shows what what appearance of cells basal cell cancer is most common in the face so biopsy shows peripheral palisade appearance peripheral palisade appearance is seen on biopsy so biopsy will show the cells arranged in a peripheral palisade pattern so since uh, we will finish up some few more questions just repeated questions only i am discussing uh, near the uh, exams i don't think you'll have more time for detailed discussion so whichever mcqs asked in the exam i am putting them as in images that's all so this is a picture showing you what finding this is a picture repeatedly asked in your exam technetium 99 m systemy b scan systemy b scan this is the investigation of choice to localize yes to localize parathyroid adenoma parathyroid adenoma repeated mcq you can see here this patient is having an adenoma in the inferior left inferior parathyroid we can confirm it with the help of ultrasound we can confirm it with the help of ultrasound localization can be added so this is technetium 99m scan so what is this this is a pheochromocytoma pheochromocytoma on an mri showing you a classical appearance called as swiss cheese appearance so what are the presentation of hyperparathyroidism swiss cheese appearance in pheochromocytoma in an mri is shown here i want only one clinical question hyperparathyroidism how will they come to hospital pheochromocytoma how will they come to hospital two topics in endocrine regularly asked in your exams hyperparathyroid patients comes to you with the bones stones abdominal groans and psychic moans bones stones abdominal groans and psychic moans so when these patients comes to me i will confirm it is parathyroid adenoma by seeing increased parathyroid hormone level 
increased calcium level and decreased phosphate level. And I will confirm the adenoma by system EB scan. Okay, that is simple management of hyperparathyroidism. Few chromocytoma patients will come to me with a yes, what features? They come to me with a pressure, palpitation, yes, perspiration, sweating. And very, very important, they will come to you with a severe pain in the head. And all these are not always seen. They are paroxysmal. See, that is why we call it as PPPP syndrome. So they come to you with the pressure, BP, palpitation, perspiration, sweating, pain in the head, paroxysmal episodes of all these things will be seen. And as I see a patient with a few chromocytoma, I will do immediate investigation of choice. 24 hours urinary metanephrines will be done. Metanephrines or VMA or the investigation of choice. I will measure 24 hours urinary VMA and metanephrine and I will localize the tumor now. So localize the tumor of pheochromocytoma by MRI. MRI is the investigation of choice. For ectopic pheochromocytomas, ectopic pheochromocytomas, there is one more old scan known as MIBG which is now replaced by SRS known as Dotatate. So new answer for ectopic is Dotatate scan. Old answer was MIBG scan. MIBG scan was used once upon a time. Now it is replaced by Dotatate. Not for pit, pit. We use Dotatate. So Dotatate is a somatostatin receptor based scan. Okay. So this is a picture showing you MIBG scan, very old MCQ. This is used to diagnose ectopic and metastatic. Ectopic or metastatic cases, we use this. But now MIBG scan, New Bailey says it is replaced by Dotatate scan. So Dotatate scan is already discussed in neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors will have uh, the classical somatostatin receptor. So Dotatate scan can be used for all neuroendocrine tumors like carcinoid, in pheochromocytoma, in gastrinoma, in many places, Dotatate is being the investigation of choice now. Okay. So, so whatever it is, yes, 68 gallium is the latest. So most of you uh, will be near exams. So just 15 more days, don't give up. Just prepare whatever you have read will definitely come for your exam. This is not a competitive exam. It is a qualifying exam. Even if you don't know some 25, 30% of the concepts from various other friends, don't worry about it. I'm sure you are going to crack with the 50% questions is enough for passing this FMG exam. So FMG students, this exam is going to be easier for you. Definitely you can crack at least some 30 to 40 questions from this section, I hope. So do well, all the best. So hope to see you all with your uh, results after the exam. Okay.